Okay, good morning. Um, sorry for the slight delay in the start of this conference and thank you to all of you who are joining us. And hopefully some others will be joining us. And maybe during the course of the next few minutes, we'll still manage to go to Facebook Live. Um, you all know that I'm Professor Anna Nakaris and I'm speaking you, to you today from Oxford. Um, and I would really love to welcome you to this celebration of 10 years of the Little Fireface Project and our Solar Earth Conservation Project on Java. I apologize, I'm a bit ill today, so I'm losing my voice, so I hope you can understand me. I'm gonna be introducing the speakers and welcome, welcoming you all here. And it's exciting to see so many colleagues I've worked with in the past and working with in the present. And I'm gonna start the conference this morning with my own perspectives and highlights of the last 10 years of working with slow lorises in Indonesia. So I'm gonna share my screen and I hope I don't lose my voice. Okay, I have to make everything else small. Okay, so um, the intention today that we, we have speakers who contributed to the Little Fireface project from foreign countries as well as from Indonesia. And so uh, the slides will be in Indonesian and in English. And I apologize because mine were a little bit last minute. So they're in my very poor Indonesian. Um, but at least hopefully those watching from Indonesia can start to um, learn more about our project as well. We also have the subtitles on, and I will try to speak very clearly because sometimes the subtitles make funny mistakes. So uh, the, here we go, 10 years of reflections on Little Fireface Project. Um, Little Fireface, where did that come from in the first place? Well, there you see a loris with its eyes glowing like fire. And when I was working in West Java with a group called the Kasipuhan, this was the name Mukageni that they gave to the slow loris. So for these little low, slow lorises, we called them the little fire faces. And this was actually inspired by Johanna Roda as well. She said, you wrote me this letter talking about the little fire faces. It's so cute. That's what we should call our project. Um, and, and what about me? Where did I come from? And how did I get to Indonesia? And how did I start working on Java? I started working on lorises in 1994. I um, started on slender lorises in India where I did my PhD. And I, I really loved slender lorises. They're really amazing primates and they are included in our slow and slender loris outreach week. And you see me down in the lower corner with uh, an undergraduate research assistant, Courtney Buzzle, who came out to Ayalore Interforestry, uh, Ayalore Interforestry Division in um, South India and Tamil Nadu back in the 90s. I then went on to Sri Lanka, which you see here. And I worked there for several years, including naming a new species or re-elevating a new species of slender loris. And, um, and while I was working there, I was getting emails from colleagues working in Southeast Asia saying, you know, you're working with these slender lorises, but slow lorises are having a really hard time. They're heavily traded. They're dying in rescue centers. Um, nobody knows anything about their behavior. When are you going to come study the, the slow lorises? And so I um, was in Cambodia in 2006 doing IUCN red list assessments of lorises. And I met Carly Starr here. And I ended up working with her in Cambodia on the pygmy slow loris for a couple of years. This led to other projects in Southeast Asia, including in Singapore, working in Thailand. Um, and here's Manun Plio Sung Sungnan who is, did some of the most amazing work on um, Thai lorises, and Pham Shundeng, who did great work on lorises, both in Sarawak and also in Singapore. Nabajit Das, I became one of his external PhD supervisors to help with his work in Bengal slow lorises in India, doing a lot of work with illegal wildlife trade in Japan, where we've changed international laws about lorises. And, um, and there we are in Vietnam, working with pygmy lorises in the South in reintroduction projects. But where does Java come into this? So uh, along the way, I was working with many people working in rescue centers in Java. And I visited Java for the first time in 2006 uh, to, to look at these rescue centers. And I started looking at all of the diversity of lorises in those rescue centers. And it immediately became clear that they probably were different species, or at least they were so morphologically distinct. It doesn't really make sense until we know better to reintroduce all these different animals into different habitats. 
Um, also, the person you saw in the previous slide, Richard Moore, the guy with the blonde hair, he was uh, selected by International Animal Rescue to actually monitor their releases because so many animals were dying, dying in rescue centers and dying in release or not being monitored during the release. And it's very hard to get funding for slow lorises. And so one of the interesting residual facts that was lying around about lorises but had never been studied before was the fact that they were venomous. And so all to, uh, kind of all at the same time, I wrote a grant to study slow loris venom. Um, I was asked at the same time to make a film about slow loris venom. This film became very popular and it popularized slow lorises to some extent, particularly their illegal trade. It helped to mitigate their trade. And also the results of Richard Moore's study showed that almost all the lorises that were released by the project he was working with died or their fate was unknown. And the few that were alive in the end, they only were alive because their collar fell off and we didn't know what happened, happened to them. So it became evident we needed to know the behavior and ecology of lorises, which is the first um, aspect of the IUCN reintroduction guidelines that we are expected to follow before we release animals to the wild. We should know their distribution, we should know their taxonomy, and we should know their behavior in the wild. And allowing, um, being able to study the super cool trait of venom could attract a big funder, the Leverhulme Trust, to allow us to do that for the first time. This is also when I met Ibu Teti, who is here today. Actually, I met her on and off a couple of times, and she agreed to become my first research counterpart. And we worked together on this project for several years, and she'll tell you about that and all her other experience. Um, alongside that film, Jungle Gremlins of Java, I would just like to say, what you're gonna be seeing today, probably for me and a lot of other speakers, are wonderful photographs as well, taken by amazing people over the years, ranging from Andrew Walmsley, who's been nominated and won some, some categories in BBC Wildlife Photographer of the Year, Robin Cox, an amazing BBC uh, cameraman. We've had um, film people out from, gosh, Korea, from Japan, uh, from Trans Tuju in Indonesia, and, uh, and local camera people as well, Wawan Tarniwan, uh, Achong Seleni, all taking these beautiful photographs. And so I think it's very important to acknowledge and uh, the many volunteers as well who've taken photographs that help us to illustrate this beautiful Javan slow loris. And this is probably the most famous photograph that's everywhere on the internet now by Andrew Walmsley, uh, taken back in 2012 of a young slow loris called Yogi. And yeah, it's not daylight here, actually. It's around five in the evening. It's just that Andrew had an amazing camera. So here's a, a little bit of the dodgy Indonesian, I apologize, <laughs> of the history of uh, 10 years of slow loris. Well, where did we find this study site in Garut? It's actually Eva Weirdeteti who knew about it already. And another student, uh, Winarti, who had done some surveys there alongside Wawan Tarniwan, who is the cameraman I already mentioned. And so based on their surveys, we ended up filming Jungle Gremlins of Java in Chipaganti. We ended up in 2012 doing distribution surveys of slow lorises across Java. We developed the ethogram. We did that study of venom. I'll tell you more about that in the next slides. We went on to study their diet, the fact they communicate in ultrasound. We built a school. We started slow loris bridge studies and we began our agroforestry projects. Um, we continued to do our research uh, with continually collared animals. And by 2017, we could really understand aspects of their reproduction. And you'll be hearing about that from me and later today. We also uh, finally, in 2019, we started in earnest our coffee project and we become certified wildlife friendly. And I'll be going over all of these aspects um, throughout this work. And we've radio tracked more than 50 individuals. And you'll see we've observed and measured many more. And we've also been doing a lot of work on social media and illegal wildlife trade. And again, those are topics of today. <clears throat> so here are some of the uh, first surveys we did back, um, back in 2012. One of the key things that happened during these surveys was discovery of populations of slow lorises in East Java. For some reason, this still hasn't made it onto the IUCN red list map. But, um, and, and it's still unclear if those animals naturally are there or if they were reintroduced there. 
but we do have some older records of lorises in East Java, so it seems likely that they are resident. Uh, we also found that actually the populations of lorises do much better in agroforestry or peripheral environments than they do in the protected areas, partially because a lot of the protected areas in Java or the, the main largest ones are at very high altitude, um, or they don't, they've been, they've been disturbed in the past and they don't seem to have the gum trees that lorises need. And because of the extensive habitat loss and hunting, uh, this Java slow loris remains critically endangered. So um, this is also something that has made them on the list of the 25 most threatened primates on earth for the last several years. Uh, so here are some of the features that were on that original slide there. One of the things that's been very important is looking at the, the behavior of the slow loris. And here's one video we have from an ethogram series that we have on YouTube. And so we've identified many behaviors of the loris, of Java and slow loris, that, for example, I didn't see in slender lorises, a number of new um, postures they exhibit, the fact that they're extremely social, they live in family groups, they can have three to four offspring at a time, um, they have a long period of infant development where they're learning to eat different foods, uh, fathers carry the infants, play with the infants. Yeah, so a lot of very interesting behaviors. And what we hope is that this series of videos and this series of um, articles that we've written with the ethogram can be used by all researchers who are working on lorises, because I don't think there's going to really be anyone else in the world studying these animals continuously six days a week for 10 years uh, that will come up with such detailed uh, data. Our data sheets are available on our website, our ethograms available on the website, the videos are all on YouTube, <clears throat> and one of our plans this year in celebration of our 10 years is to publish the entire ethogram in Indonesian in an Indonesian journal as well. So I mentioned we've radio collared more than 50 individuals, well we've caught and measured 141 individuals as of you know, last month. These are just some of them. And uh, this is just really amazing to see the difference in these individuals. In the past, some people thought the more red individuals were a different subspecies. They just turned out to be much older. So as they get older, they turn pale and more red. Some people thought the little fluffy dark ones were something called Nyctisivis ornatus. That's just a, a young fluffy baby loris. So by looking at this great diversity of individuals, We've been able to learn a lot about their behavior, their body size. Males and females don't differ in body size. Maybe males are a few grams more. When females are pregnant, they're significantly more. Um, but in general, they, are, they conform to a unimale, unifemale social organization with males and females lacking sexual dimorphism. So um, it's very interesting. And this beautiful face, facial mask uh, has some symbols, which I'll tell you about in a minute. This one. So the function of venom has been a really cool part of our research. And one of the things that we've suggested the venom is for, or evolved for is to mimic cobras, as you see in that first panel. Uh, and we also know that the venom can kill people and it certainly can kill other slow lorises. So there you see George Madani, who was bitten by a slow loris and was able to sacrifice his somewhat embarrassing photographs to help inform their conservation. Like I said, those beautiful facial masks that you see there, they and the dorsal stripe, the stripe on the back of the animal, they seem to be an aposomatic signal that helps them to advertise how venomous they are or that they're dangerous. Brightly younger, more colored animals are the ones also that tend to get into more fights. So if we look at the uh, use of the venom, how it is used now, however or why it evolved, it's certainly 100% used for intraspecific competition with many, many animals getting these horrific head wounds. And the wounds are the worst when the loris is dispersing at around three years. So they leave their home possibly a bit earlier. They may go off, try to leave home and come back. But you could see even if they, if they do leave home, they settle, they may not stay, disperse again. And at this three year period, we see while they're trying to settle, they're getting the, the most wounds. This other index you see here shows their incredible 
territoriality with very limited overlap with other individuals. As you can hear, I'm losing my voice. So I'm just gonna have a small drink. Another major factor we have encountered over the years is slow loris diet. In my work in Cambodia and my work with Nabajit Das in India and the work of others in Malaysia and other parts of India, we consistently saw that lorises were eating lots and lots of gum. And despite this knowledge, and despite the fact that lorises have an incredible number of morphological characteristics, like here you could see their rounded legs that help them cling, you could see their gouging with their incredible tooth comb, um, they have a very long digestive tract that helps them to digest gum. And I chose these two photographs just so you could see all the holes the lorises make on the trees when they gouge for gum. And you could see in the dry season, they're eating even more gum, well, actually it's slightly more gum, but still in the, in, sorry, in the uh, dry season, they're still eating half gum. And in the wet season, they're eating more than half gum. And the main other food that they are eating is nectar as well. So they pollinate flowers. And why this is important, if an animal has 50% of gum in its diet, it affects everything about it. It affects where you could reintroduce it. It affects whether or not you can reintroduce an animal without teeth. Animals in illegal wildlife trade often have their teeth clipped because of their venom. And so, and what's very interesting about our study site is we are working in an agroforest where lorises could eat all the fruit they liked almost any time of the year, and they incredibly rarely do it. Um, and it might even be for medicinal purposes that they do it, or I need to check the data very carefully. Is it mainly lactating females that do it? Or youngsters who don't know what they're doing. We've had youngsters pick up fruit and look really confused and drop it and go like, oh, I'm not supposed to eat that. So it's very important in rescue centers and in zoos, animals get obese, they die because of fruit in their diet. And this absolute confirmation that these are exudativorous animals uh, has been very important to our work. We also have always integrated education into our work. And this book, Slow Loris Forest Protector, Uku Kang Sang Penjago Hutan, has been one we've been using uh, for a number of years now. And officially, we, we actually monitored the impact of this book in 18 schools around our study sites and 12 additional schools island-wide testing nearly 2000 children and its impact on their learning. And one of the keys that we had in this book was an ecophilic approach, only about the role of the loris in the forest, the love between the loris and its family, the function of the loris eating pests and pollinating flowers, the cool fact a loris is venomous and not telling children they're extinct, they're dying, they're endangered, there's illegal wildlife trade. Because the purpose of this book was to get children to love slow lorises. And the indications in our research was that it did help them to do that and made them on them by themselves find out more about lorises and to learn they're threatened and to themselves make pledges never to have them as pets. So if we could get 2,000 children who were in our program and more than 7,500 children who bought that book, were given that book um, to not want a loris as a pet, that would be. That's pretty incredible. Even if a handful of them decided to become champions. So uh, another major aspect, that's our ecology. We have also our empowerments has been the development of our, our agroforestry program. You're gonna hear more about this later, but our big celebration in the last two years was our farmer certification as wildlife friendly enterprise network coffee with improved coffee production, improved forest cover, decreased use of um, pesticides and herbicides and increased potential income for the farmers once we start to sell this coffee, which we're doing right now. So if you're watching, you could buy that on our Etsy shop and in Indonesia, it's gonna be available on our um, LFP Toko. One of the other important things we've been doing is training people and having a volunteer program. We've had 117 volunteers since the beginning of the program. And there you could see from 2013 to 2021 um, in the volunteer program, it started out as being almost all foreigners and now it is almost all Indonesians. Those foreigners came from 18 different countries and the Indonesians came from three different islands. 
and uh, 49 Indonesians versus 68 foreigners with more Indonesians now learning about our project and volunteering every day. Um, these volunteers have contributed to our 14,000 hours of data collection that we have collected since 2012, which is an incredible amount of data collection. And there you see actually related to that wildlife friendly um, coffee project, the sign in the village that says we are a conservation village with a total ban on hunting any, any animals, any protected species, including slow lorises. We've also had a number of PhD students work on the project. Um, and these, th these, are, these are the students and you will hear from a couple of them today. And so um, including the latest one, there's Sophie, who's actually currently doing her PhD and the others have all finished and are all working in conservation. And so um, we're hoping very soon to get our first Indonesian PhD student working on the project as well. Uh, I can't do this work without a number of funders. You're also going to hear from one of our funders today. Those on the top line are the, the people who funded our project almost every year since the very beginning, as well as Sheldon Wildlife Trust here. So this little group of, of guys has kept us going from the very beginning. And we're ever so terribly grateful because we're a very small project. Um, at the moment, we have about 19 staff and volunteers who are doing all this work that you see. So if you're interested in volunteering, you can um, follow us on Facebook or Queen Fireface or Little Fireface on Instagram. You can download all our materials on our website. You can email me um, and I'm gonna end my, my, my talk now and stop sharing my screen. So I will be able to introduce the next speaker. Okay, so... Uh The next speaker today is going to be Ibu Weirdeteti. Um, it's a real honor to have Ibu Weirdeteti with us today. She is actually, I would say, Indonesia's champion for nocturnal primates. She's been studying nocturnal primates in Indonesia, she'll tell you, but at least 20 years or 25 years. She's working <laughs> with Lippi, she's very interested in genetics, and she's um, really supported our work and we've in both English and Indonesian, we've written many, many papers on slow lorises together. And she's going to tell you about her work on slow lorises. So, Eva Werdetati, I invite you to share your screen. Okay. Oh, okay. Thank you very much for uh, you invite me to this meeting, uh, Prof. Ananakaris. And I'm very happy to uh, present in here. And uh, good afternoon for Indonesia uh, time. And good morning for everyone. Uh, Okay, just a minute, I saw my... Okay. Okay, uh, my introduce my name is uh, Wirda Teti. I am a researcher at uh, Research Center for Biology in Indonesia Institute of Sciences. And I'm working on mammals, uh, 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 includes uh, primates, uh, especially uh, nocturnal primates uh, for strawberries and tarsier. And uh, for regarding uh, uh, the strawberries, uh, I have a uh, following the research uh, maybe uh, more 25 years ago. And I'm happy uh, as a counterpart uh, from uh, the little project uh, 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 come to Indonesia. And now I want to, I would like to uh, present a scene uh, of uh, Indonesian loris research and development. But I'm sorry, maybe I can speak in Indonesian because uh, my English is not so, so good. Uh, so, okay. No problem. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much. It is just uh, to repeat. It is uh, now uh, uh, Indonesia have uh, seven species. Uh, based on international ICN or uh, Nekaris at all 2020. Uh, seven species in distribute in Indonesia from uh, nine species in the world. Uh, this uh, Hillary or North Sumatra and this uh, Kukang from South Sumatra until uh, uh, East Sumatra and then uh, Bankanus and then uh, Niftisipus, uh, Japonicus, Japan Loris in Java and these three species gain in S uh, Java, uh, uh, South uh, of uh, sorry, uh, S Kalimantan, South Kalimantan, and 
uh, Central Kalimantan. And these two uh, species in outbreaks in, uh, oh, sorry, <laughs> in the uh, Indochina, in Bengalensis, in Myanmar, uh, Sri Lanka, and, and uh, India. So the Nikki uh, uh, protects in 1930 by Indonesia law. And ICN is this Japanicus, uh, Bankanus, and Bengalensis, uh, critical and ginger, uh, Kukang, Hillary, and Pygmius, and ginger, and Menagensis, Ayan, and Borneo, and this uh, Kalimantan uh, population uh, vulnerable. Okay, so Bahasa Indonesia. Uh, bagaimana uh, studi yang sudah di jalan yang kami lakukan? Jadi untuk slowlories, uh, uh, yang pertama uh, seperti yang pertama kali saya belajar uh, untuk penelitian slowlories ini pada tahun 1906 atau lebih kurang 24 uh, tahun yang lalu. Uh, 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 saya punya empat slowlories dari Nymphanover, kemudian uh, di keep in captive. And uh, at 1919 eggs, uh, when I go to master, master degree, uh, uh, saya menggunakan slowlories untuk my thesis uh, about molecular. Uh, saya tertarik uh, uh, different uh, perbedaan uh, garpu di uh, kepala on the head pada slowlories. Uh, and so uh, I'm using the slowlories to my object of the research. Uh, pada saat itu sangat terbatas sekali limited information of uh, slowlories and Uh, referen just to for taxonomy uh, public public uh, publikasi uh, dari peneliti peneliti luar and uh, have not yet uh, found the publish from Indonesia researcher or Indonesia student. Sebaliknya, the slowries uh, bebas dijual pada waktu itu 24 tahun yang lalu atau uh, 24 years ago. Uh, the slowries is free to be sold and uh, high just still get trades. Uh, saya pikir itu kontrol atau monitoring dari uh, satwa liar uh, secara keseluruhan ini, itu sangat uh, uh, masih rendah, tidak seperti sekarang. Kemudian kita uh, sangat mudah untuk menemukan slowlories di uh, traditional market, di beer market, di mall, and shopping center. Dan banyak masyarakat tidak tahu bahwa slowlories itu atau kukang itu dilindungi. Dan harganya sangat murah. Uh, berkisar hanya uh, 10.000 sampai 15.000 per individual atau sekitar uh, 1.6 uh, until 1 dollar uh, per individual. So very very easy to get them and very uh, easy to buy by uh, people. Uh, perkembangan setelah penelitian tentang slowlories setelah saya master degree, kemudian saya melanjutkan untuk penelitian uh, slowlories uh, tentang habitat distribusi genetik and captive breeding. Di sini saya juga uh, untuk mengembangkan penelitian saya mencoba uh, ini di sini sebagai membimbing dari banyak student the, uh, untuk penelitian slowlories dari beberapa university. Kemudian penelitian juga sudah mulai dilakukan oleh NGO kemudian rehabilitasi center seperti uh, like ya. Yeah. Dan ini uh, dari tahun 2000 from 2000 until 2010 or 2011 I think just uh, eight publication, eight publication for slowlories. So very, very uh, little for uh, publication of slowlories. But now, uh, from 2020, uh, uh, 12 until now, uh, I think the uh, penelitian tentang slowlories is growing rapidly, and especially sejak tahun 2015. And saya mengkontak lebih, uh, kurang lebih 40 uh, publish Uh, Soloris uh, oleh student peneliti uh, dalam nasional uh, jurnal nasional dan 25 papers di antaranya itu uh, uh, sejak tahun 2015 dan umumnya penelitian memang masih pada uh, berkisar pada uh, Nikisibus japanicus sementara untuk uh, the other spe uh, species like uh, Nikisibus uh, kukang and menagensis uh, I think still still uh, low. Uh, kemudian penelitian ini uh, ke, yang lebih banyak itu tentang ekologi uh, dan distribusi itu lebih kurang uh, 60% and captive uh, 25% dan uh, laboratory uh, genetics uh, paling uh, itu 15% jadi masih uh, very very low for uh, um, laboratory uh, study uh, for slowlories. Dan dari tahun 2012 itu sudah banyak yang uh, artinya pen, apa? Sudah banyak yang uh, sadar dan perhatian terhadap konservasi slowlories. 
dan beberapa yayasan seluruhnya sudah established terutama di based on di uh, distribution uh, salaries of location and this uh, my scope of my uh, study uh, field study and captive reading and laboratory uh, ini adalah uh, uh, survei yang uh, uh, saya lakukan selama uh, mulai dari tahun 1999 sampai sekarang uh, For Solo Risniki Sebus Kukang, uh, ini yang sudah uh, kami lakukan survei, have uh, um, a study uh, in Lampung, uh, South Sum uh, Sumatera, Palembang, East Sumatera, Jambi, and a small island uh, of course with uh, the Batang Island, uh, Singkep Islands uh, juga sudah dilakukan, and then uh, Java, uh, Banten, uh, West Java, Central Java, and let, uh, let us recently in East Java. And then this the uh, uh, Kalimantan, the South Kalimantan, Central Kalimantan, and East Kalimantan uh, 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 Penajam district. We can see the how the uh, different of of work on the head of its uh, species. Uh, recently, this uh, previous I uh, explained is this uh, uh, distribution on Japan tropics in Central in Central Java. Itu di uh, Pekalongan district. Uh, Peteng Kriono Forest uh, and Plantation. Kemudian di Kaki Gunung uh, uh, Wilis di Kediri Istrik Jawa Timur. Kemudian di uh, Pantai Selatan Malang, uh, wilayah Kondang Merak. Uh, we found the Sloloris, uh, the uh, uh, Spondias tree, and altitude zero meter above uh, sea level. Very, very close with uh, the beach, uh, maybe 25. And the second, Uh, Slowries with uh, we meet uh, maybe uh, 15 uh, meter from the beach. This is uh, is Java. Ini adalah foto-foto uh, yang bisa kami ambil image yang bisa yang uh, kami uh, yang uh, saya lakukan selama survei. Ini adalah Slowries uh, di uh, Jawa Timur. Uh, kemudian ini adalah di Jawa Tengah. Kemudian ini uh, uh, Jawa Barat. Uh, dan ini adalah South uh, Sumatera, kemudian ini adalah Lampung, still, still yang. Uh, if we go to the uh, the field, we we, uh, uh, we have to collection of then a sample, like uh, uh, sorry, uh, saliva, fecal, and hair and uh, blood. Kemudian juga kita melakukan survei di uh, uh, beer market, uh, traditional market. And then uh, uh, collaborative with stakeholder in handling slow risk uh, confiscated. Uh, is this uh, activity uh, in captive breeding? Uh, when uh, uh, we got uh, the slow risk of con confiscated animal or from wild, usually we uh, uh, kita lakukan adaptasi di uh, kandang. Uh, itu take time to uh, until uh, three months. Uh, sampai solorisnya uh, merasa uh, aman di kandang, kemudian kita melakukan uh, di uh, captive breeding kita melakukan study tentang konsumsi pakan and uh, behavior, uh, kita mencoba uh, beberapa buah-buahan, kemudian juga dari insek, kemudian gam, kemudian juga dari uh, honey atau madu. Nah ini uh, kegiatan juga di uh, captive breeding itu adalah breeding, jadi setiap kita dapat Uh, Soloris uh, from confiscated animal from wild, uh, we put in uh, the cakes uh, one pairs, and this uh, the result of the uh, the uh, the result of production of uh, the Soloris is uh, from uh, West Jap uh, 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 Japan Loris in the Sumatra Loris. Uh, the problem for the baby. Uh, Uh, when uh, all uh, the babies uh, seven and eight uh, months, usually the baby dies. Maybe uh, I think fifteen uh, percent, uh, maybe uh, a baby's uh, baby uh, day in the kick. I, I don't know why, but uh, just fifteen uh, percent uh, survive until uh, that. Uh, in this uh, in captive breeding, kita juga melakukan identifikasi terhadap penyakit. Uh, this uh, uh, kind of the diseases uh, uh, found of the slow release in captive breeding. 
uh, external parasite uh, the cause of the uh, animals die are uh, loss and bloating is uh, kita menemukan uh, the uh, intestine and stomach uh, blood and then uh, sometimes we found uh, intestinal folding so i mean intestine into intestine so it's the same uh, sort into the sepsin uh, and and this uh, the high of or, or diet of animals and this abscess the abscess uh, i think uh, many cases uh, we found in the captive breeding i see maybe I think maybe uh, this animal um, many sit uh, in uh, the bog or in uh, uh, the tree. So, but uh, the abscess uh, uh, usually survive or uh, uh, survive in the captive. Uh, this activity and laboratory uh, just genetic study. This is just uh, for my lab, and the aim of genetic analysis. Uh, for identification of species based on molecular and for population structure, uh, genetic character of its species and phylogenetic of uh, relationship between and uh, with, within species and to identify or slow risk confiscated before release and helping of law enforcement for illegal trade on the slow risk. Uh, for genetic, uh, I'm using the matricon real DNA uh, ini adalah salah satu uh, uh, gene target uh, cytochrome B for uh, to know how the uh, genetic of the uh, slow loris uh, in Indonesia. Uh, we can see uh, there are three uh, uh, there are three uh, groups: Nictisibus kukang and this and this uh, for uh, Kalimantan. I, I have just for uh, individual. And uh, and this uh, uh, the from the Kalimantan uh, four uh, individual from Kalimantan one uh, Kalimantan from East I think this sample yeah uh, is this sample from East Kalimantan is this uh, displayed with uh, the uh, other uh, uh, I mean uh, berbeda dari uh, tiga uh, individual yang lain so I don't know is this a kind or no because so. Uh, uh, I don't know, uh, uh, saya belum punya uh, sequence of uh, the uh, Nictis Buskayan. And this from Java. So from Java, is this East Java and in this uh, West Java. So uh, maybe uh, any two groups or, uh, in species or two population are uh, different, but it is still one species. And this I tried to using uh, the network program uh, to identify uh, identification of the confiscated uh, animals uh, using C1 gene uh, based on haplotype. Jadi uh, di sini uh, uh, saya menggunakan 75 uh, menggunakan 75 uh, individual of uh, stories uh, dari confiscated animal and wild uh, in this Nictisibus kukang and this menagensis and this uh, Nictisibus japanicus. A black color ini adalah confiscated animal smuggling from Jakarta. Ini from Bali, confiscated animal in Magenta, a confiscated animal from South Sumatra, uh, Palembang, and this wild animal from uh, South Sumatra, and this from Lampung, and this confiscated animal from uh, uh, Lampung, and uh, 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 the violet, uh, the violet uh, color is this uh, from wild. So we can identification of uh, the confiscated animal based on the, uh, the this program, and this uh, from uh, Kalimantan, and this is uh, Kalimantan, and this South Kalimantan, and two sample from Central Kalimantan. And this one uh, from uh, confiscated, and this one from uh, Pangkalan Bun, Central Kalimantan, and this from Javanicus. Uh, this circle uh, uh, is uh, uh, Java. And this from uh, West Java and this from Central Java. So uh, we can see uh, the yellow uh, color is this confiscated animal. And this uh, confiscated animal, uh, 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 green color. And this from uh, Garut, this is from Garut, this is uh, from uh, Tasik, and this is from Chiamis. So we can see the sample of confiscated will be. Uh, uh, we can uh, we can identify uh, 
uh, come from of confiscated uh, animals. And this uh, uh, Japan's lalories. So we get uh, we get sample from West Java and East Java. And this sample, Jatin, Jatin, is this uh, confiscated animal from uh, Surabaya uh, bird market and Kediri, a traditional market. And this sample from Garut, uh, uh, confiscated animal, uh, but is this uh, one group, uh, one population uh, from is uh, Java. And this from Central Java. Now, now, uh, after the reflection of uh, the little fire press project on solar research in Indonesia, uh, I try to summarize uh, how the about uh, solar risk uh, in last 10 years uh, with a long uh, recent of the uh, little fire uh, project research in Indonesia. Uh, I summarize uh, from 2011 sampai uh, tahun 2021, Uh, saya bisa mengatakan bahwa uh, dengan keberadaan Little Vice Project uh, in, in uh, uh, riset in Indonesia itu dapat meningkatkan uh, konservasi of lorries. Uh, kita bisa melihat uh, stakeholder such as uh, Nature Conservation Agency or BKSDA uh, itu lebih concern ini especially from West Java lebih concern terhadap uh, konservasi lorries and And um, uh, this project uh, can uh, encourage uh, the student and the researcher uh, to care of stories by research. We can see many publications and active in media online uh, for stories or uh, conservation, uh, like in journal, thesis, essay, and media online, and provide uh, our availability on the biology data of stories, especially Japan loris. Uh, like uh, uh, ecology, uh, habitats, uh, feed, nutrition, and venom, and is And peningkatan pengetahuan masyarakat uh, tentang uh, wildlife itu meningkat, di mana uh, community lokal uh, seperti Cip uh, Cipaganti, uh, local Cip uh, Cipaganti people, understand the meaning of the conservation and the presence of the stories and the plantation or Uh, uh, their, uh, their forest in uh, around uh, village. And stakeholder awareness uh, concern about solar risk was uh, the increase. Uh, FRP project can be to provide input to management authority, uh, like uh, uh, in here, um, uh, forest ministry, to development of solar risk uh, conservation. And besides that, uh, uh, we can see uh, From 20, uh, 2011 until 2000, uh, uh, 2020 or uh, 14 years, uh, bisa kita lihat perkembangan dari penelitian seluruh di Indonesia itu uh, meningkat. Kemudian terlibatnya volunteer, uh, volunteer uh, uh, from student, uh, researcher, or people uh, around uh, around where. Uh, Uh, LF, LF uh, um, stay itu sangat membantu untuk meningkatkan kepedulian dari uh, kehadiran seluruh dan konservasi mereka. Kemudian juga uh, local people seperti uh, Cipaganti itu mendapatkan satu edukasi tentang fungsi and benefit of wildlife such as seluruh uh, uh, around them, uh, meningkatkan ekonomi dan uh, sebagainya. Kemudian transfer knowledge, uh, knowledge uh, Uh, dari proyek ini kepada masyarakat, kepada peneliti atau student atau volunteer, dari program ini, ini kita dapat jadikan sebagai template uh, untuk diimplementasikan uh, di dalam penelitian pada uh, spesies lain dari uh, satwa liar, uh, khususnya uh, spesies dari genus uh, Nyctisibus. And the last, uh, a lot of information uh, have published, uh, Maybe I, I don't know, maybe 2020 publication uh, dengan uh, begitu uh, banyak data uh, yang uh, yang uh, sudah uh, terangkum di dalam penelitian ini. Uh, ini uh, saya pikir hasil riset uh, uh, from uh, 2011 and until 2000, uh, 2060. So is this amazing? Uh, uh, ini yang harus uh, dapat uh, uh, kita pelajari. Uh, maybe. For me, as counterpart, is this uh, very important how to the handling 
uh, this uh, 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 the project for get uh, how to the publication. Jadi uh, ini suatu uh, apa suatu gambaran yang 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 sangat uh, uh, perlu uh, ditiru khususnya untuk Uh, Indonesia researcher or student Indonesia yang bisa diterapkan untuk penelitian-penelitian uh, uh, selanjutnya. And I hope uh, uh, this project uh, uh, be continue to uh, research Indonesia loris not just for Nikisibus uh, Japanicus but the other uh, Indonesian loris species of Indonesia loris. Uh, I think uh, enough for my presentation. Uh, thank you very much. I stop here. Thank you so much, Ibu Hiratachi. That's wonderful. I'm, we, we are now live on Facebook. So just so everybody knows, we're live on Facebook, but there are still some minor technical difficulties and we're monitoring questions on Facebook. Does anyone have any questions for myself or Ibu Hiratachi now? We have a small um, discussion time, but otherwise we could always save questions to make up some of the time we missed due, the, due to the technical difficulties. But I realize some people might have a question now that they would love to ask. Otherwise we have several points for discussion. So think about your questions. Let's can, make I ask, up. can I ask a quick question? Yeah, yeah, please do, please do. Avibi, thank you, those were amazing. Um, oversight talks you know giving a really detailed view of what you've um, learned over the many years it's fantastic i was really shocked um about the how little um their this the lorises are sold for in the markets mm. that's astounding it's as though but and, and then are they are quite often they're used as tourist props is that as well as pets are they then used to generate income Um, no, not on Indonesia. They don't. They're not really used as tourist props. That's more in in Thailand. <clears throat> But they they're just uh, they're often for young girls. They have them as a pet, and the price that they start at from the first hunter is about half a pack of cigarettes. So th that's actually one of the reasons the hunting ban is not so difficult because they're not a high value species. But because they're easy to catch, you may as well catch one when you're hunting other things. But by the time they leave Indonesia, if they get smuggled out of Indonesia, that's when they get more expensive. So they can, in Japan, for example, reach $10,000 or $20,000. Right. But in Indonesia, they've never been very expensive. Okay. Oh, thank you. Yeah. So as you said, hopefully that if, if there are fines or something that might, you know, that a twice or three times what you'd earn for a loris, that might be a good um, way of stopping it if it's implemented. So that's why awareness is so important because actually a loris is less expensive than a domestic cat, like, a, like not a, a breed of cat, let's say. So if you were to buy a Siamese cat, it would cost 10 times the price of a loris. So by trying to change attitudes, I don't know, for people to get other kinds of domestic pets um, is really important as well. Oh my gosh. Tati, did you want to say anything about that question? About the price of lorises? And how it's changed over the years or? Yeah, uh, the price of loris maybe in Indonesia, I think it uh, uh, depends on of the, uh, the big market, like, uh, like uh, in Jakarta, like in Jakarta is very, very, uh, uh, illegal trade, but uh, very expensive uh, for Indonesia people. But like uh, in the big market traditional in like uh, this district in like uh, when I go to uh, the East Java uh, la uh, last two years, and the store is just, uh, uh, the price just uh, maybe uh, how, how, how many dollars? Uh, $10 maybe. Ten dollars, maybe, maybe, maybe ten dollars uh, around around ten dollars. And sometimes uh, the solo risk change of uh, uh, the other animal. So a uh, barter, uh, solo risk barter at uh, uh, at uh, like bird or like cat or like uh, 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 what's uh, the seafood, uh, something like that. Uh, and, and, and and traditional market, uh, I found like this in 
in the uh, traditional market. Uh, I can maybe. One thing that I found very interesting as well is speaking to hunters. They say they catch the pretty lorises and they recognize that lorises bite each other and, and damage their, their face and their head with their venom. And so they say if they catch a really ugly loris with a terrible wound, they put it back because they can't sell it for very much. So I thought that was very interesting that the hunters recognized that lorises bite each other. And that's sometimes why they cut their teeth in transport so they can't bite each other when they're in a box. And um, yeah, it's interesting. Okay. Thank you both, thank you. Okay, so I'm gonna move on now to um, Nabil, Ahmad Nabil, who is currently one of our research assistants in Chipaganti. And his video has been pre-recorded. So I think Katie is gonna share that with us. And he's going to be talking about some behavior of oh, uh, behavioral aspects he's been studying during his time as a research assistant for the Little Fireface Project. Katie, do you want to introduce this anymore? Hello. Um, yes, so this is Nabil's presentation um, on exploring behavior in the Java and Soloris and I think he can take it from here. Halo semua, selamat pagi teman-teman yang berada di Inggris. Selamat sore teman-teman yang berada di Indonesia. Selamat malam teman-teman yang berada di negara lain. Perkenalkan, nama saya Ahmad Nabil Fatur Rahman. Saya di sini sebagai research assistant di Little Fireface Project. Hari ini saya akan berbagi pengalaman saya mengenali perilaku kang Jawa. Oleh karena itu saya akan melakukan presentasi. Presentasi yang saya lakukan yaitu Exploring Behavior and Food Resource of the Javan Slowris Nikisebus in Cipaganti. Atau dalam bahasa Indonesia perilaku jelajah dan sumber pakan oleh Kukang Jawa Nikisebus Javanicus di Cipaganti. Saya menggunakan studi kasus perilaku Kukang Jawa LFV di tahun 2020 selama satu tahun. Ya, yeah. introduction atau pengawalan. Di sini suatu individu dianggap mencari makan ketika aktivitasnya terdiri dari makan atau berpergian. Meskipun waktu perjalanan mungkin tidak terkait dengan mencari makan, misalkan pada rute antara ma acara makan terakhir hari itu dan tempat tidur, sebagian besar perjalanan adalah waktu yang dihabiskan untuk mencari makan. Selanjutnya di slide ini saya akan menjelaskan tentang study site atau lokasi penelitian kami. Kawasan kami berada di Indonesia, provinsi Indonesia, no, maksud saya provinsi Jawa Barat, di kota Garut, di desa Cipaganti. Kami telah banyak mempelajari tentang kukang Jawa yang berada di Cipaganti sejak tahun 2011. Kenapa kami berada di Cipaganti? Karena menurut IUCN, kukang Jawa saat ini berstatus critical endangered atau terancam punah. Setiap harinya semak dan di setiap harinya kukang Jawa semakin menurun populasinya. Hal ini disebabkan karena kehilangan habitat dan penjualan satwa liar. Saat ini saya akan menjelaskan tentang activity budget atau perilaku harian kukang Jawa. Di dalam slide, saya telah menampilkan grafik perilaku harian kukang Jawa selama satu, satu tahun di tahun 2020 yang di... Uh, maaf, maksud saya dalam grafik perilaku yang paling dominan dijumpai yaitu pada perilaku EX atau exploring. Dapat dilihat dari tabel yang yang saya beri warna merah. Selanjutnya, saya akan menjelaskan tentang pola pergerakan kukang Jawa. Jika suatu individu melakukan kegiatan exploring atau uh, perilaku jelajah. Yang pertama yaitu ada walking atau berjalan dua 
climbing horizontal atau memanjat menyamping. Yang ketiga ada climbing up atau memanjat naik. Yang keempat ada climbing down atau memanjat turun. Yang kelima ada suspensory walking atau berjalan menggantung. Di saat ini saya akan menambahkan video perilaku exploring yang dilakukan oleh Kukang Jawa. Ya, selanjutnya saya akan menjelaskan tentang three species use for exploring atau dalam bahasa Indonesia spesies pohon yang digunakan kukang Jawa untuk melakukan exploring atau jelajah. Dalam grafik terdapat beberapa jenis pohon yang digunakan kukang Jawa untuk melakukan pergerakan. Yang diantaranya ada tujuh jenis spesies pohon yang digunakan untuk kukang, maksud saya yang digunakan kukang Jawa untuk melakukan jelajah. Yaitu yang pertama ada Eucalyptus sp atau kayu putih. Ada gigantlochoa ater atau bambu teman, ada tunasinensis yaitu pohon suren, ada akasia dukurens atau jengjen, ada persea americana atau nangka dalam bahasa Indonesia atau dalam bahasa Inggris jackfruit, atau grivillea robusta uh, pohon mohon maaf pohon saya lupa nama bahasa Indonesia nya. Kemudian ada kaliandra atau kaliandra merah. Selanjutnya saya akan menjelaskan tentang feeding occurrence atau kejadian makan. Di saat ini saya akan menjelaskan selama tahun 2020 tercatat jenis pohon yang digunakan kukang Jawa untuk melakukan aktivitas makan dan ada tujuh jenis spesies. Ada tujuh spesies pohon yang di, yang paling dominan digunakan kukang Jawa untuk melakukan aktivitas makan. Yang paling banyak yaitu ada Acacia ducurens atau jengjen, ada Kaliandra, Kaliandra merah, ada Eucalyptus sp atau kayu putih, ada Grivillea robusta, pohon salamander, ada Tunasinensis itu pohon suren. Ada giganto cowa ater itu bambu teman, ada persia americana yaitu nangka. Selanjutnya saya akan menjelaskan tentang three usage comparisons atau komparasi penggunaan pohon. Dalam slide ini saya menjelaskan bahwa perbandingan pola jelajah dan kejadian pakan yang ditemukan selama tahun 2020 dan terdapat tiga jenis pohon yang paling dominan digunakan kukang Jawa untuk melakukan per perilaku jelajah dan perilaku makan yaitu yang pertama ada akasi ukurans jingjen ada kaliandra yaitu kaliandra merah dan eucalyptus sp yaitu kayu putih pada slide ini saya akan menjelaskan tentang tabel jenis pakan dan pohon apa yang digunakan kukang jawa untuk melakukan pakan untuk melakukan makan yang pertama eucalyptus uh, di pohon kayu putih ini kukang jawa juga, uh, dia memakan bunga, kemudian dia juga memakan getah, dan kemudian juga dia mem memakan serangga, dan paling banyak dia, mem dia memakan nektar. Total di pohon ini dia sebanyak 17. Untuk kaliandra kalotirsus atau kaliandra merah, hanya ditemukan bahwa kukang jawa memakan nektar sebanyak 44. Untuk akasia ducurens, kukang Jawa banyak ditemukan untuk uh, banyak ditemukan memakan uh, getah atau gam sebanyak 53 dan serangga satu kali. Jadi total sebanyak 54. Selanjutnya kesimpulan. Yang pertama di tahun 2020 aktivitas Profesi kukang Jawa yang paling dominan yaitu perilaku jelajah atau eksploring. Kemudian, 
Nomor dua, perilaku jelajah mengindikasikan kokang untuk mencari sumber pakan. Nomor tiga, terdapat tujuh jenis pohon yang dominan digunakan kokang Jawa. Nomor empat, jenis pohon yang paling banyak dijumpai kokang Jawa untuk melakukan perilaku pakan terdapat di pohon. Pertama, Akasia de Kurens, yaitu Jengjen. Kedua, Kaliandra Kalotirsus atau Kaliandra Merah. Dan yang ketiga, Ekalyptus SP atau Kayu Putih. Terima kasih telah menonton. Thank you so much. Um, I know that is Nabil with us now. Yes, he is. So we're going to move on to the next talk and then we have another chance for questions. So basically every two or three talks we'll have some questions. Um, so Katie, you can stop sharing your screen. And Nabil can wait for his questions after the next speaker. So while Katie's stopping to share her screen, I'm going to introduce our next speaker, who is um, Dr. Muhammad Ali Imram. He's Associate Professor at Universitas Gajimada in the Department of Forestry Conservation. We met several years ago um, through another colleague of mine working on primates. And I and um Yeah, and so he, he took over as the research counterpart of Little Fireface Project when Ibu Teti could no longer do so. Um, and it's been really amazing. We've got a MOU between Oxford Brookes University and Universitas Gajimata. We've been able to visit each other's institutions and we've had many, many students now from UGM come to work with the Lorises in Chipaganti, including our current field station coordinator, Um, Tunga Dewey, who was a graduate from UGM. So I welcome Dr. Imran to share his, well, I don't know what I'm going to do. I have to get Katie yes. to stop sharing her screen. Yep. Oh, there you go. Great. Uh, yeah. Can you see my screen? Yes, I can. Okay. Thank you very much, uh, Anna. Uh, yeah, it's on the full screen. Okay. Uh, today I'm going to talk about um, more general on the challenge for biodiversity conservation in Java, particularly uh, it is also known as the most fragmented island in the world. So uh, I'll try to talk it quick. Uh, so let me introduce myself. I'm working in the Universitas Gajah Mada of Yogyakarta in wildlife ecology and conservation, the faculty of forestry. And I, at the moment, I also as a position as vice dean on research, community services, and also cooperation. So let me introduce a bit about our university. So we are quite uh, all uh, university in Indonesia, of course. It was established in 1949, and currently we have uh, around 56,000 students uh, and 18 faculties and two school, and we are also Uh, encourage our work uh, for the pro rural development and also pro good governance. So, uh, in our work, we uh, always try to combine between education, research, and also community services. So, I will uh, later on uh, explain how we deal with this uh, uh, pillar uh, in our work. And this is my lab uh, in uh, the Faculty of Forestry. And I also uh, give a link for our website. And we are mainly working on ecology management, also conservation of wildlife. And we offer also some courses from bachelor to PhD. So yeah, I hope everybody know Indonesia and particularly Java, where we always talk about this island. So let me a bit clear about Java. So Java is not only the Uh, main island in Indonesia, but also known as the highly density populated island in the world. So as you may see here that we have around 1,000 uh, people uh, within one square meter, six square kilometers. So it is really dense. Uh, and as you may imagine that uh, if we have a dense populated island, it must be also hard for biodiversity conservation. What we can see here that 
although it is very densely populated island, uh, but our recent study using uh, species distribution modeling uh, using 12 mal mammal species and also 80 uh, aphid species, we try to model uh, how those species uh, can be uh, used habitat in Java. So we found that there are still some area which uh, which considered as the uh, high uh, biodiversity hotspot, as you may see on the top of the figures. Uh, there are some red mark over there uh, that that indicate the high biodiversity area. And yeah, and unfortunately that Java uh, we have a high pressure, but also unfortunately less concern. As you may know that Sumatra, Kalimantan, or even Papua, they have a lot of concern uh, for conservation. But Java is a very few. Uh, particularly uh, research uh, bodies and also uh, what do you call uh, funds for conservation for Java. So we have to ensure how we can work for conservation in Java. And yeah, also that uh, many area in Java is uh, under the management of uh, Perhutani. And as I mentioned before that NGO and international scientists go to other island and focusing more on social issues than environmental issues in Java. And I believe that with the trend of the development, Java can be seen as future trend for other island. And this why uh, I think uh, what Anna already done uh, until now is that uh, working on Java is crucial and it will help a lot for conservation in Java. So because it's kind of reflection, I try also to reflect myself. Uh, so this is my first paper on uh, seeing how uh, biodiversity conservation in Java. And at the moment, I got a fund from uh, Finland, Finland Embassy to observe uh, a Menorah Hill nearby Yogyakarta. And I found that even it's only uh, not under managed by government, there are a lot of opportunity to have uh, more species in uh, community forests. At the same time, we found that uh, urbanization, uh, which caused uh, less people stay in the uh, rural area, uh, have a good opportunity for the biodiversity to uh, take a breath again because less pressure in uh, rural area. We wrote a book also about this about uh, 20 years ago on this. And next I will talk about how we work with uh, LFP uh, to work on conservation. So yeah, we found uh, that uh, there are still some uh, threat for uh, biodiversity in Indonesia, particularly with that uh, there's still some uh, poaching issues, as well as uh, high demand for pets, for singing bird, bird contests, and also some animal lover, they, they want to have pets for themselves using a wild animal. And how we do, uh, so we actually start to establish research and community services. Uh, so we establish site in Central Java, uh, in Kemuning Forest, as you may see, uh, it is still have a what do you call a second secondary forest uh, combined with a coffee plantation, and we found a very interesting uh, phenomena about uh, biodiversity. We found many different uh, mammal species as well as a bird species, and including uh, slow loris that uh, become. Uh, a connection between me and also Anna. And we found also some, at least three species of gliding mammal in uh, this communing forest. So we start with our own way to, uh, to do research. And then Anna come to, came to our campus. We invite her uh, to come for a sabbatical leave. And yeah, we did a lot of activity, including education, uh, assisting students for uh, research, and also exchange, even visit our site. I think that was a very wonderful time 
with Anna uh, during stay in Yogyakarta or even when I uh, was in UK uh, for a visit as well as we did uh, some project together. And since 2016, we have a very intensive interaction, uh, not only uh, with Anna, but also with other colleagues uh, who do research and also community services. And yeah, then uh, we found a very interesting discussion uh, during our interaction and uh, we start to turn the angle of our research and community services into wetland friendly shade grown coffee or shade grown coffee issues where it is important to think uh, for Java situation because we don't have a lot of NGO who willing uh, to support uh, working in Java. So we are thinking about how we can finance ourselves for research and also community service. So we, as you may see on the left side, uh, there are still some trees, uh, secondary for us and but below you can see the coffee plantation below it and we still find some uh, lorises in the area as you may know that uh, there are some uh, type of uh, shade grown coffee and in our situation we have uh, this traditional polyculture or coffee garden uh, which is uh, quite uh, interesting for us because we still uh, find that uh, coffee was planted under the secondary forest because otherwise uh, the forest will go and uh, the local people actually try to keep this as forest, but they ask for uh, additional plantation of coffee uh, below the shade. And yeah, as Anatol asked about the MOU between uh, Oxford Brooks University and also Umitas Gajah Mada, we established many activities, including last year, before just before pandemic, we have a workshop on uh, wildlife friendly coffee uh, workshop in Garut. And that was my last meeting with Anna. And yeah, this is very interesting uh, phenomena that uh, not only doing research, but uh, our interaction also encourage, uh, uh, what do you call, uh, the, the art of the science itself, because as you may see here, the, these are the thesis cover for uh, our student, but I encourage them to create their own cover, which you may see this is very interesting cover for a scientific work that uh, maybe you, you may suppress because it seems that you are going to read novel, but actually it's uh, scientific works. Yeah, of course, uh, we got a lot of uh, support as well, like example, we, had an opportunity to try the collar uh, in our uh, slow loris in uh, Kemuning, and we published some uh, poster as well as a paper, as you may see. I think I learned a lot from Anna and his team and her team uh, on how we publish a uh, good journal article as well as uh, in a high uh, ranking journal. So I think. We as uh, faculty of RSC learn a lot because we are not, not only me uh, who involved in this uh, publication, but also other college and as well as uh, sometimes we got a summer course and uh, inviting Anna or uh, Marco to join in our uh, summer course and providing us some uh, thought about this uh, issue on conservation. Yeah, to combine with this, Research, we also do community services. Uh, this is just a very short one. We, yeah, we, we did uh, approach to local leader where uh, until it reached the point where uh, they have a very interesting uh, awareness on the, uh, on the uh, slow lorries. And even they develop their own, uh, what do you call, mascot for, for the village uh, with the slow lorries. So I think that's a quite impressive one that we didn't do anything, but they, they because our interaction, then they established this uh, mascot for uh, the village. And we also uh, established a local regulation uh, in the village who tried to, which tried to reduce the effect of poaching in the area. We also did some uh, livelihood improvement by uh, providing assist 
uh, for local people for post harvesting improvement for the coffee plantation coffee products including uh, stingless bee uh, management uh, for local people and yeah we do a lot as anna told us also that we do a lot of uh, environmental education study we try to use the method from lfp uh, in, uh, applied in our study site and yeah this is one thing that we also brought off because we instead of we uh fight the poacher we try to invite poacher to join in our uh wildlife monitoring particularly bird so since 2016 until now we have a relatively regular monitoring with local people so at least three times uh, a year we have data on the uh, bird uh, diversity uh, which help us also uh, to update our data on the bird diversity yeah we also identify there are potential uh, volunteer tourism let me say like that which uh, including research support for friend for research or training doing environmental education uh, and it's characterized by short to medium time visit and there are a lot of students coming to our study site at least around 30 uh, tests already produced from our uh, study site yeah in conclusion to make it short we are happy to join with the uh, little five phase project initiative which led by uh, Oxford Brookes University because we feel that uh, both scientific atmosphere and also community services are enhanced uh, in this respect. And yeah, we are thinking about uh, future plans on expanding our network and also wildlife research and conservation, as well as uh, trying to find possible uh, exporting community co coffee using wildlife friendly coffee scheme. And also in the future, we, we found out that with this uh, COVID uh, pandemic limitation, we think that uh, encourage volunteer tourism, particularly domestic students to the community service with us will be very important in the future. Thank you. And I'm really happy to join with this uh, initiative. And I give the time to Anna. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, it's a wonderful talk and some happy memories there as well. And I'm just, uh, we do have a few minutes if we want, if anyone would like to ask a question. Otherwise, we could carry on with talks. There's no, there's no questions on Facebook at the moment. And I'm going to leave time for questions at the end in discussion. Um, and discussion even between us as the presenters, but I don't see any questions in the chat. So. I will, I will just carry on then, and we could have our discussion at the end. Um, thank you so much, Imran, for your wonderful talk. Uh, next, we're going to have a, another section of talks about illegal wildlife trade and also back to research at the field site in Chipaganti. And the next speaker is going to be Kim Fedima. She's a PhD student in Australia. I'm her external supervisor. She also did her master's with us um, at Oxford Brooks a few years ago. And she was going to come to Indonesia to do some work on illegal wildlife trade and marketing perspectives. But because of the pandemic, her research had to go online. So she's going to tell you a little bit about what we've done over the years tackling online trade and um, what her research is about. So, Kim, I invite you to share your screen. I can see your screen. Yes, I can. <laughs> get everything sorted out. Yeah, hopefully you can see me and the screen. Yes, I can see both now. You just need to go into full screen. There you go, fab. Perfect, awesome. Um, great, well, I'm so um, excited to be a part of the conference today and I'm happy to have seen the talk so far. So it's been really interesting. Mine is a little bit different just because um, We've heard some amazing things so far about the, the fieldwork aspect and what's going on um, in Java, but like Anna was saying, unfortunately, I never made it to Java. Um, but I think that one of the most um, exciting things about LFP is that even though it's such a small core team um, that are involved, 
the reach of the organisation has actually gone so big now that even though I'm sitting here in Perth in Western Australia and Anna's in Oxford and people are in Java, we can all still have an impact through the organisation, um, which is really great. Um, so like Anna said, I'm going to be talking more about the online trade. So um, you may be familiar that kind of, um, although this is a long time ago now, um, the, one of the big things that kicked off um, the Slow Loris trade um, worldwide and the global interest in the work that Anna and the LFP team are doing was this Slow Loris video on YouTube that came out in 2009. Um, I did check today and it's this video alone um, has had 7 million views and thousands of comments. And actually even today there was a new comment put up about 10 hours ago now. So even though it's 12 years old, it is still getting um, traction and people are still finding it. Um, the video itself is of a pet slow loris called Sonia. Um, and the basic premise of it was that the slow loris was being tickled by the owner and that um, people thought it was a super cute video of this slow loris really enjoying an interaction with its owner. Um, but unfortunately for those of us that work with slow lorises, we know that in fact this behaviour is a, um, a threat position and that the slow loris being venomous raises its arms in order to signify that it's feeling threatened and anxious. Um, because of that, um, we had some real issues with everybody wanting the slow loris as a pet. So the demand for the pet trade went really high, even though this video was showing um, what we know to be really an example of animal cruelty. So this really kicked off the, the work that LFP was doing on this issue of imagery and what happens when um, this small cryptic species from the jungles of Java meets the extreme reach of the internet. So even though um, they were working on this um, for, for a long time beforehand, these three articles were really the start of the illegal wildlife trade online space. So they looked at facilitating the trade through advertising and sales websites, the drive for the demand across the world and the cruelty that was involved in producing that content. And the spread of misinformation about species behavior and appropriate husbandry, because of course, when we have social media, we have that capacity that we're all now familiar with of misinformation in those YouTube comments, the Facebook comments. And a lot of people um, were sharing information about the species themselves that was incorrect, about the legality of owning species or trading species. And so there was a lot of work to be done on how to combat all of that. And that work um, actually has been pretty successful. So I did say this was the most recent comment, but I did make my slides a little, um, little while ago, a couple of days ago. So the newest most recent comment from today um, was asking why the video hadn't yet been taken down. Um, but before that, we have seen people saying things about this cruelty. So the, the slow loris is having their teeth cut off by poachers and being sold as pets. And that most recent comment was from a week ago. And the top comment, so the one that has the most likes, um, and you can see the number there, it's from about four years ago. Um, and he's talking about having reported the video because of that misinformation and because of those issues um, of having these animals as pets. So it's a double-edged sword that even though we have this massive vehicle of um, interest in the slow loris as pets, when the work is done um, and as successfully it has, as it has been by LFP, people can become your champions and they can start um, really doing the work for you in a way um, of making those positive comments and fighting back within those channels as well. I mentioned before as well that as well as just driving that demand, we do see um, imagery being used for photo props, not so much. Um, in Java and in Indonesia, but in other Southeast Asian countries like Thailand in particular, but also even moving across into Europe. So one of the studies that was done was on imagery in Turkey as well. 
So those photo sharing platforms, um, they allow users to share photos and videos of the lorises and often that's being done on beaches or in high tourist location spots and the tourists are encouraged to hold the loris um, as you can see in the picture there and create that tourist memory of their, their amazing and exotic lifestyle that they can share on their social media. Um, they do that really um, as a way of impressing social networks in order to get clout um, and in order to showcase this um, adventure that they're having on their travels. But very, very rarely do we see them posting information about the species or um, doing anything to try to educate the viewers or themselves on what is actually going on in those encounters. So what could be a very brief encounter for the tourist um, doesn't really portray the context of that life that that loris is having and the journey that it's had to get there through often being taken from the wild. So that can have really severe impacts on welfare and conservation. And I'll just have to move something. Um, and we do often see, um, like was shown in previous things about the confiscated lorises, that they do often have very short lifespans as well, um, which sets up this constant need to be uh, hunting more lorises and getting more income from this. So in response to that, um, there has been work done across these different social media companies to create some kind of um, coalition to end wildlife trafficking online. So this was begun in 2018 and most of the big companies have signed on to it. So Google, Facebook, which owns Instagram and WhatsApp as well, um, and TikTok, which is one of the most um, highly growing um, social medias that we're seeing today. So they have signed on um, and have uh, really taken this stand publicly that they're going to try to progress their ability to track and stop wildlife trade and wildlife imagery online. And you do see um, these little pop-ups that come up. So this is just an example of one on Facebook, but they have them on Instagram as well, that if you try to search for those uh, wildlife imagery um, or photo props or anything like that, it will let you know. Unfortunately, it doesn't stop you from actually searching for it. So you can just X that box and keep going. And so oops, sorry. we are still seeing all of these pictures down the bottom here of lorises that are still in trade and are still being sold. Um, there was a question earlier about the price of lorises and how they're so cheap. Um, obviously I haven't been to Java, so I can't talk about the trading there, but really interestingly on social media, we also see these trade groups that come up a little bit like Facebook buy and sell and Facebook buy nothing groups that are popular in Australia and the UK. So lorises aren't just bought for cash amounts, but they're also traded either for other species or for other objects as well. So um, as an example, off the top of my head, I've seen them traded for vape cartridges and things like that as well. So the LFP team, like I said, have been working on this and looking at not only that imagery, but also what that outcome is. So how are these trading groups operating online? What is the, um, the prices that animals are being sold for, the methods that people are using to try to conceal their behaviour if they're doing that, um, and all of these different social media operations and platforms that are driving these trade um, practices. And this is one, something that is able to be done from across the world. So we have um, colleagues of mine in Thailand, Oxford, myself in Australia, and of course in Java as well, tracking um, this behaviour. So some of the papers that have come out from that have been looking at what are the actual species that are being traded? So looking at the taxonomy of species, because we do have really quite a large data set of images and videos of lorises that are being sold. And one of the things about social media that can be quite handy, as bad as it is, is that those um, that old saying of what's on the internet is on the internet forever, 
um, is quite true in a lot of cases and you can get some really excellent retrospective data sets um, that can give you a lot of information on things like species numbers that are being traded. Um, we can also look at um, the role of um, the anthropogenic alley effect is another one that's been looked at. So whether rarity is something that is driving the trade, what are people's actual behaviours and why are they operating in these ways? What is it that's driving them to buy these animals? Um, and also not only what are those behaviours, but what does that mean for conservationists? How can we actually make a difference in, that, in those behaviours? Can we change people's perceptions the way that those education um, programs have worked so successfully on the ground? And then finally, like I was saying before, um, looking at what is the reach of this? So looking at, um, in this particular paper, trade that was happening in Turkey as well. And so going through some of the, the outcomes that we've seen, this is just um, some comments now that we're seeing on those um, images and uh, for trade in social media in Java. So this is one example. Um, just like we started to see a change in public perception on the YouTube video, starting to see some people um, commenting and pushing back against trade of slow lorises within the trade groups themselves as well. Um, so I'll kind of not read all through these because there's um, quite a lot of text there, but people letting um, their people in the social communities know that the species is protected, that they um, might suffer fines or they might have um, uh, be caught by the police if they do that behaviour and encouraging them to release the animal as well. So it's not all, yeah, like I say, doom and gloom because the other great thing about social media and viruses is that it allows us to do things like this conference. So by using Facebook Live today, even though we had some issues, um, we're able to spread all of this good information about the work that's being done and about the slow loris and hopefully encourage people to um, do their own um, research into the species if they have just clicked on this video by seeing it um, because they're interested in slow lorises, as well as reaching that academic side of things through publications as well, through things like the Little Fireface Twitter and social media platforms like the Instagram as well. We can reach people that aren't within our own conservation circle and, and continue changing people's minds. So hopefully 12 years down the track, again, we see an even greater push towards um, conservation attitudes and um, changing this social media um, issue. Excuse me, I'm losing my voice as well. Um, and I just had a few last pictures here as well of some of the um, work that Anna's done through National Geographic Kids as well, because social media is reaching more and more young people. And that gives us an opportunity to create those conservation champions from a really young age as well, which is something I think is really moving and shifting that tide of conservation for this amazing group of species. And yeah, that's my talk. So I'll leave it there. If you have any questions, um, feel free to ask. Hopefully I didn't go too quick for you. Thank you so much, Kim. Um, so we're, we're going to have time for questions after the next two talks. We have another little discussion period. So, it, it, yeah, and it's really amazing to see that all put together in that way. And it makes me feel really proud of what LFP has done as well. So carrying on from the, the wildlife trade, whereas Kim couldn't get to the field and couldn't do, go into the markets, our next speaker, Ahmad Ardiancia, did so for about a year, a year and a half as our wildlife trade officer. And he's gonna be speaking to us today from the Netherlands where he's studying for his master's. Um, so hopefully he's here to share his screen. Trying to see if he's here. There you are. <laughs> Welcome Ahmad. So this is just a little short talk um, and Ahmad's also gonna help get us back on time. Thank you so much. Yeah, uh, so good morning everyone. So I'm Ahmad Ardiancia. I used to be a wildlife uh, wildlife trade officer in the 
uh, LFP for a year and a half, um, approximately. And I'm really glad that I'm being here to share uh, about the findings um, in the market. So first, I want to talk about uh, my experience during my uh, experience being a wildlife threat officer. Uh, I think uh, this experience uh, just give me a really insight about what is happening uh, about the inside the the wildlife of world of Indonesia because Indonesia indeed uh, I was told that since I um, elementary that Indonesia has a greatest biodiversity among the world and yeah I mean like it's very nice to know that Indonesia has a great biodiversity, but to some extent, Indonesia also uh, experienced some biodiversity loss as well. That one of the driver is the wildlife threat. So as I got into this job, so I found some very, uh, yeah, like scary, uh, 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 yeah, phenomenon because there, there are there are there are a lot of animals that being sold in the market that I haven't expected that much, and so for example, uh, so in total, uh, Java is around fifteen to twenty market we regularly survey, and as you can see from this uh, uh, graph, so basically we focus on the Java and Bali, so West Java, Central Java, and East Java. And as Jakarta, where is the capital city of Indonesia located, has the most animals in terms of number and variety. And yeah, also some uh, other cap uh, big cities in its province, such as uh, Yogyakarta, or Sur 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 Surakarta and Surabaya, uh, also has quite a lot of numbers of animals. But uh, I believe uh, this high number is not just affected by the, you know, like the, because the, the city was the capital of uh, any region or because there are a lot of uh, people there. I think, I believe that it's also um, related to the cultural belief about this particular market because in Japanese uh, belief, uh, uh, the bird keeping uh, practice is such of a uh, mandatory because when you have a bird in your room or in your house, you are believed as very a true man, true Japanese man. Mm. And also, the number of variety any, any, of animal is significantly correlated with the size of market. That is a uh, uh, findings that generally we found in uh, our findings. Also uh, related to the, to the asking price, we surveyed that uh, every uh, city that we surveyed has a different, uh, yeah, has a different level of uh, the price of the same animals. For example, because uh, Jakarta, of course, uh, has more purchasing powers, uh, the price are like twice uh, to the city that a bit smaller, such as Chirapon and Tasikmalaya. And for uh, some reason, the asking price were stabilized throughout the years, but for certain species is increasing. And maybe there is a link between uh, the market can keeping up with the supply and demand. And for certain species, why it is increasing? Because is it Sometimes it's not possible to breed the certain uh, animal. Uh, for example, the leopard cat that has been uh, like the most, uh, uh, yeah, cutest animals that maybe uh, attract uh, some people to keep uh, them as a pet. Um, yeah, so the price for certain species is increasing because throughout the years, it's getting rare, like to find this uh, species in the wild, therefore the asking price is increasing. Also, we found um, when we compare uh, 
the number of uh, animals from the very past time to recent time. And for certain species that is really uh, highly regulated as uh, the endangered ones. Uh, and we focus on the Sunda leopard cats. We found that during the past time, it's kind of pretty common to find this species uh, in the market, for example, in the city of Jakarta, Pramuka. But when we go back to the uh, market for uh, from the range of uh, 2012 to 2018, it's becoming more rare. And we, um, yeah, we uh, expect that must be uh, a shift from uh, selling this uh, animal to, from the physical market to online market. And uh, the animal that uh, being sold in the online market is not all the species. It's only for the species that highly regulated because sometimes you have the animals that is highly regulated, but it's becoming, you know, becoming protected because uh, um, yeah, because the international focus on the species, but for some species that is in danger, but it's not becoming a focus of the like international, like the birds mostly, uh, they just uh, keeping it uh, to the physical market. So yeah, there is no, uh, uh, there's a, how to say, like a uh, difference between uh, why these animals are being shifted to online, why these animals are still being kept in the physical market because this kind of uh, uh, international highlight. So yeah, I think that's all. And yeah, I just want to say uh, congratulations to Ibu Anna for uh, again uh, reaching a, a year older of this uh, very long uh, focus research about salaries. So yeah, I hope uh, everything will be going well. And yeah, so thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> thank you so much. And thank you for your talk. And although it's very sad, I think it's such important research. And thank you for all the time you spent when you were with the project. And I'm really hope that what you learned from us is helping you with your degree now. Yeah. And you're going to come back and be a leading conservationist in Indonesia. Yeah, thank you. So um, the next speaker uh, in this section is Johanna Roda Margono, who was our first ever PhD student um, at Little Fireface Project. And she's gonna tell you about her time there, her research, and she's now doing amazing things. And she's probably gonna tell you a bit about where she is now as well. So welcome, Johanna. Thank you for sharing your screen. Sorry, I had to unmute me. <laughs> okay, hello everybody. Nice to uh, meet you, to see you all. Um, yes, I was invited to give a little bit of a like um, a recap of uh, how it all started in um, in Chipaganti. So yeah, my name is Johanna Rodemagono. Um, I'm nowadays also the chair of the IUCN White Pig Specialist Group. I'm doing uh, work, for example, on uh, Babi Kutil. Uh, in Java, and um, I'm the executive director of a conservation charity in Germany that is um, concerned with uh, species conservation. So I was asked to give a little bit of an impression how it all started, and uh, this talk will be a little bit more like anecdotal and stories and pictures, so not many hard scientific facts, so I hope that is okay. Um, thanks to the organizing team, we translated my um, uh, my PowerPoint into Indonesian, but I'm going to um, talk in English. So I hope you can all follow. So um, we started with our uh, with our PhD with my PhD project uh, supported by the Leverhulme Trust. 
um, and the PhD was titled Ecology of Venom Use in the Javan Slow Loris and its Implications for Conservation. So it was about the venom, but also about what does that mean for the conservation of the um, highly threatened species. There were two main aims of the uh, uh, PhD. So first was to investigate the ecological function of the venom in slow lorises. So the first aim focused on the venom. And secondly, uh, to use the ecological data um, gathered to assist in the development of conservation strategies and plans for slow lorises in captivity and in the wild. And regarding to the venom, we at the very beginning, so remember this is uh, 2012 when we started or 2011 when, when the preparations of the PhD started. So we started with four hypotheses that we wanted to test. So first was predator defense. So Slolorises are using venom, uh, venom to fight off predators that want to eat them. Um, second, prey acquisition. So they would, um, I don't know, like uh, startle or not startle, but but um, immobilize prey so they can eat them. Um, the next one was ectoparasite avoidance so that they would uh, lick themselves, anoint their fur so they would have less ectoparasites because um, at the beginning, we assumed they are not very social animals. Of course, we know that uh, not, know now that this is not true, but because they were always seen um, alone, we were thinking, oh, maybe they can't groom each other, so they need the venom to fight off ectoparasites. And the last hypothesis was um, social interaction, so potentially fighting um, amongst uh, uh, themselves or similar. So this was the... Um, the timeline of my PhD. So uh, we started in Indonesia in February and April 2012, and we spent two months in Chiapas in the International Animal Rescue um, Center there. Um, in April, we did, uh, uh, Anna came over to uh, Indonesia and we did um, uh, several weeks of surveys, especially in West Java. We added uh, some in East Java as well with my colleague um, uh, Alke Voskamp, um, and I already showed uh, one of her um, uh, publication outcomes. Um, and then from May on, we started the field work um, in Chipaganti from May 2012 to July 2013. So I'm going through these phases um, quickly. So the first was in Chiapas, the two months in Chiapas. Um, the purpose of that time was that in Chiapas at that time were around 100 rescued slow lorises, and some were uh, released back into the wild as well. And I was talking about that. Uh, Richard Moore was leading that. So um, the, the purpose for me was to practice the handling of the animals, observe them, um, develop, um, prepare an ethogram, uh, trying to follow them together with Richard in, in the forest. Um, so basically to practice. And also on the picture here, you see that we practice to, to get the samples um, of the saliva and the venom um, from the animals. Um, it, it was a quite a difficult time as well in terms of uh, getting research permits. On the picture here, you see the very complicated process on getting your permits at that time. I believe that it's even more <laughs> um, complicated now. So the second phase was um, the surveys in April 2020 and also before and after, but that was these were the main surveys. Um, the purpose of that was to find um, the best study site for radio tracking because we really wanted to radio track wild animals. So not the released ones, but the wild ones um, or the, the ones that were never like captured by humans. Um, also, we wanted to start building a team um, and we needed to start socializing with the potential stakeholders at the sites we visited. So if we would uh, choose one of the sites. We, of course, need to know if the if the Kipaladesa, if the uh, head of the village and, and all the um, government authorities in that area would welcome us or rather not. So you can see here uh, some pictures of the of the surveys. You see a Kulugo up there. And on the bottom, you see um, Paade. He um, was a former um, hunter of slow lorises but then wanted to to save the slow lorises as well and i think he's one of the key persons of these surveys and of the start of um the little fireface project because he 
was able to catch the animals like nobody else. And he passed his skills also to, to the people um, that are involved now. Um, you see here the map on the bottom right. This is from um, Alke Foskamp's publication. Um, these were the different survey sites that we did. So together with um, Anna, I think I we only did like uh, five, four or six, so more in the West Javan region, but Alke um, and I uh, partly, we also went to other places. Um, and last phase was then actually starting in Chipaganti. How did we actually decide for um, starting Little Fireface project in Chipaganti? So one was, of course, the amount of slow lorises that we saw during the survey, because we needed to make sure that they are there and that there are quite a few of them. Otherwise, um, it wouldn't make sense. Um, again, the support of the stakeholders, so the farmers, this is like a, like a mosaic kind of habitat between forest, forest patches, but also a lot of fields and farms for the ones that haven't been there yet. Um, and uh, the village had they all needed to support that we start our work there. And also, um, we wanted to have a balance between natural habitat, because actually we wanted to uh, study the, the natural behavior of the animals and um, the, the uh, forest garden type of um, terrain, um, and also the potential to catch. Uh, on the left side, you see Paade again, how he's climbing a tree and trying to catch one of the of the slow lorises. Um, yes, so when we started to catch the animals with the help of Paade at the beginning, um, we then uh, took a lot of samples. Of course, as I said, my PhD was about the venom. So the sampling that we did, we sampled the venom from the, from the inner elbow of the slow loris, from the glands, and then from um, saliva as well, and feces. And we try to do ectoparasites as well, but if you may know, um, slow lorises don't have a lot of ectoparasites or most of them have none. So <laughs> there, there wasn't a lot, a lot of sampling going on for that one. And then of course we release the animals and we um, stored the samples and later on analyze them. Um, <clears throat> of course we started following the animals. So you can see some images of teams here. Um, and some of the animals, they had radio collar um, for the first time for these really wild, uh, naturally behaving animals. We saw uh, some babies, we saw them feeding. So these were all the very first um, impressions of the life of a wild slow lorises. That's very quickly. So um, uh, what, uh, the, the, what the ex aspects of the um, research was. So on the left side, I'm going to say it in, uh, in English now. Uh, so the aspects of the PhD was the general behavior, feeding behavior and habitat use. So that was relevant to the venom research because we wanted to know the source and acquisition of the venom and also test the prey capture hypotheses. And of course that had relevance to conservation as well. So what are the crucial resources uh, how do protected areas potentially need to be um, designed, um, suitable habitat, and also, also husbandry of captive animals. Then we have the social organization mating system, social behavior, territoriality, ranging behavior, all these things. And this was to test the intraspecific uh, in, intra competition um, hypothesis. And of course, this has relevance to husbandry as well, and the design of release schemes. How many do you um, release and in what uh, constellation. Um, then the next one was uh, distribution density ecology of the uh, potential predators uh, and species. So this was, sorry, that's number four, is the predator avoidance hypotheses. And of course, that has a lot of um, relevance to conservation as well. What are the suitable habitats? What are the animal communities um, where you should release uh, slow lorises? Um, uh, do slow lorises need to be trained to protect themselves against predators and so on. And the last one was the parasites um, of them to test the parasite defense hypothesis. This has relevance to medical care and husbandry of ca uh, captive animals as well. So that was a quite interesting setting. I'm not going into detail because since the last 10 years, we found out so many more um, uh, um, information. So it doesn't make sense to tell you all the information I, <laughs> I gathered uh, 10 years ago. Um, but what about the venom? Um, 
during my PhD, we were not able to get the final export permit for the venom. We wanted to analyze that with uh, um, Professor Brian Fry from Australia, who is a venom expert, but we did not manage to um, get that, um, the samples out during my PhD. Um, and also we were not really able to match the, ven the, the characteristics of the venom, like how, how much venom is it, um, specific characteristics of venom between um, uh, differences between sex or age or dominance, um, hierarchy and so on. So we could not really match um, that. Uh, but uh, on the positive side, it opened a lot of um, other questions. We um, had some, some publications in relation to venom. For example, the first year what, uh, was about the structural comparison. And of course, also um, uh, the very recent publication in, uh, about intraspecific competition, which um, Anna already mentioned that this is the most likely, or at least one of the hypotheses where we can say yes, 100%. And then there are, there, um, there are a couple of uh, pictures now, just some highlights from 2012, um, sorry, 2000, yeah, 12 and 13, um, things that we were not so aware of, maybe some we, we were thinking, but we had no uh, um, confirmation. So one was, of course, slow lorises are quite social. So on the left side, you can see Guntur and Ina um, cuddling together. Of course, this is a couple, so this is uh, all right. <laughs> on the right side is a baby, which is uh, pretty big. This is Tahini with her mother, Tere. Um, at that time, um, but we also saw males, for example, Guntur and his son Yogi, they were running around together all the time, um, hugging and everything. And um, so it's not that they don't completely, are completely asocial. So they have a social system, they have a social organization. Um, so uh, that was very interesting to observe in the first couple of years. Oops, sorry, that wasn't, ooh. Okay, I show that. Another thing that we, what was already said before, in the short time, this is just a, um, a data from the short time that I um, did my PhD. So we also saw that one of the most used um, resources in terms of uh, food was the um, gum of Zhengzhen, so the acacia, um, and also the nectar of the Kaliandra. And what's interesting here, um, highlighted in yellow, I'm sure that was... Um, shown and, and investigated um, now as well. Again, uh, in, the, in the dry season, the gum went up to 70% used and the Caliandra, of course, it was not blooming down to 2%. And as Anna, Anna said, uh, fruit is not used much at all. Um, and of course, a lot of um, insects. So they're real gum specialists. Um, then the other thing was um, how flexible they are with the habitat. So you can see a picture here about the habitat on the left upper side. You can see like a, I think this was even like a bamboo forest or like, like a little forest pot patch. And then a lot of different um, um, uh, vegetables grown and uh, trees interspersed between the fields. And um, the slow lorises used the water pipes. They were quite able to... Um, uh, climb from one place to the next, even even if we think, oh, they are too far, but actually they are quite good in that. And they did use the ground as well. So they were um, sneaking under the tomato plants or something like that. So they were quite, quite adaptable to that. The other thing what Anna already mentioned is um, their ability to heal and adapt. So maybe you know some of these individuals. So on the left side, this is um, one eye that at the time we um, met her the first time, she had already only one eye, so we don't know what, what uh, happened. Um, this is Aska, who was completely fine before, and actually uh, um, a couple of one month after this uh, horrible accident or whatever it is, we didn't know, um, he was completely normal again, so he healed completely. And on the bottom you see Cookie, and we always wondered, why is the eye shine green? It was really, really weird. And, and that animal was moving very strangely as well. And what, what happened apparently was that that eye animal was blind, um, but it still was walking around and climbing around. And um, after a while, we, we had it for one or two days in the field station because we thought we have to help it, but we actually released it. And I think, I think it was fine. <laughs> didn't get a collar, so we couldn't follow up, but it was a very interesting animal as well. 
And this is our field station. We arrived there with uh, Matt on the bottom and I. We were the first internationals that uh, came to the field station. We hired, um, we rented Ruma Salamander um, and we just brought one uh, one uh, suitcase of equipment. And that's uh, that was how it all started. And then we uh, moved into Ruma Hijau, wh which was then the bigger place because we got more and more people on the on the project. And um, this is now just like a very quick uh, recap about mistakes and um, failures, so to say. I mean, I don't, I don't actually think there are real mistakes and failures because they all should lead you to um, uh, to improving what you're doing. So one is um, the like it, whether you act uh, culturally inappropriate or not. So <laughs> what I did because I love dogs, I got some dogs and they were in the house and I didn't really think about it, but then one day the Kapala Dessa came and said, you can't keep the dogs in the house. And I was like, Ooh, why? So these are things um, that you have to learn sometimes the hard way. Um, communication issues as well, because uh, I am not very good in Bahasa Indonesia. I tried it at the beginning, but then got confused with um, Bahasa Sunda. And then in the end, <laughs> everyone wanted to learn English as well. So I didn't end up really speaking well Indonesian. Um, volunteer expectations, especially for the international volunteers, they sometimes uh, it was more the case that these volunteers wanted to have like a good experience, have fun and have holidays. But if you ask them to do one of the shifts between uh, uh, midnight and six o'clock in the morning, can you can you follow the animals? Oh, no, I'm tired. I don't want to do that. So so you have to really manage expectations as well with the volunteers. Um, uh, equipment and field work, there were sometimes problems as well. There you can see one of the animals de developed a rush. So we took the collar off and everything was fine afterwards. So um, again, they healed very well, but uh, there are some, some things you have to learn as well. And the most important for me is that I was, um, I think, too ambitious. I wanted to try too much. Um, I'm happy about that now because we all see wh where where then all went. So it's an ama amazing project. Um, the only one uh, long term project um, on uh, slolorises, Javan slolorises, um, but it was hard work at the beginning. Um, working in the night, trying to arrange permits in the day, doing habitat work in the day. So basically never slept, but um, it worked out in the end. Um, I'm almost done, sorry, Anna, for taking a bit uh, more time. Uh, socialization, of course, is very important. We started right at the beginning, but because we had so many things to do, I think now I think we didn't do enough. So you really need to um, calculate your resources and time to incorporate socialization and um, making friends with the, with the local communities and asking them what they think, incorporating them in everything you do. So very important. And of course, it's always teamwork. It was not me alone. It was a whole team of, um, of uh, helpers uh, from the village, from the international students. So that was really, really important. So what happens with me personally now? So um, I did the slow lorries work. I also met some uh, pigs in the forest. So what happened now is that I'm very um, uh, engaged in pig conservation. So there are quite a lot of uh, um, threatened pig species in Indonesia as well, this is the Bawean water pig, the Javan water pig, and Babirusa. And also, what I keep still is my passion for the little known species, the ones that nobody is really interested on uh, in, but that are super interesting and also worth um, looking at and conserving. So this is the Talaut couscous, for example, and one of the Sicilians um, in Chipaganti. This is actually a Sicilian from Chipaganti. So thank you very much for listening. Thank you so much for your talk. Um, they always say, if you want to have something done, ask a busy person. And, and we're always uh, talking about, you know, who who was on the project that did incredible multitasking and, and you really laid the foundation for people to have to follow in their ability to multitask. And, and I, I'm the same. So I think we, we're good role, role models to try to make people multitask and do lots of things. And and I think it is something that's really characteristic of our project is this ecology, education and empowerment. And since Johanna was there as this single, incredibly uh, capable person, 
we had discussions at the time of how we needed more people. And now there are people in all those roles. So we have an education person, we have a um, agroforestry person, we have field station coordinator, research coordinator, and, um, and that's why we're able to do even more. So I'm gonna see if anyone has any questions. We've had three talks now. We have some kind comments in the chat, thanking people for their talks. I'm gonna go on and see if there's anything on Facebook. Anything on Facebook, guys? Some people are checking over there. Okay. Well, if you're shy, you can also write your questions in the chat. So, um, yeah, that seems like nobody has questions. Do do does anyone that's what like here have questions for the speakers? Okay. Well, I'll just carry on then, then we'll get back on time. Um, so I'm going to introduce then the next speaker, who is the current multitasking <laughs> busy person. This is Katie Hedger, who is the current um, Indonesian project lead. And uh, she's been with our project for a couple of years now, having previously done uh, her work experience in undergraduate research in Danau Girang in, in Borneo with Slow Lorises. And she's um, been a, a, a main person having to deal with this incredible myriad of long-term data sets. And she's gonna give you some impressions. Because I think if you want to do a 10 year project, understanding all of the data and the management that comes with that is incredibly important. So Katie, I'm gonna ask you to share your screen. Great. All right, hello everybody. Um, thank you for joining us today. As Anna said, I am the current research coordinator and also the project lead. Um, I'm based at our research station in West Java, although currently I'm in the UK. Um, and as research coordinator, really one of my biggest roles is managing our data. And I think you have an idea now, having seen some of the previous speakers' presentations, you might have a better idea of just how much data we're talking about now. Um, from Johanna doing all of those incredible things literally in the very first year of our project and um, I'm the one now who is managing that data alongside everything else we've ever collected. Um, so that's what I'd like to give you um, some more information about today. Um, so I'll be speaking in Indonesian, uh, sorry I'll be speaking in English, I'm not speaking in Indonesian but my slides will be in Indonesian. Um, so of course the main data set that we have is on the Java and Slow Loris. We have a wild population that we've been studying in Chipiganti for 10 years now. Um, to give you an idea, as Anna said, we've been following them for 12 hours a night, six days a week for the last 10 years, um, which has resulted in a lot of data. To give you an idea, uh, I checked a couple of days ago and we have collected over 193,000 data points on the behavior of slow lorises um, over the last 10 years. I think in 2020, we had our biggest yearly data set and it was about 38,000 data points. And that's just from observations of slow lorises every night. Um, as Anna said, we have studied 141 known individuals. This doesn't include uncollared individuals that we see sometimes interacting with collared lorises in the field. This is just individuals that we have usually caught, sometimes collared, um, or the offspring or partners of known individuals as well. Of those 141 individuals, we have given a collar to 76 of them. And when they have a collar, that means that we can track them um, long-term in the field using VHF radio tracking. And we have also, um, we have also observed or identified 70 offspring that have been born to known individuals within the field site over the last 10 years. So when I say data point, um, I'm referring to a line of data in Excel. And when we're in the field, this is the data sheet that we take in the field. So you can see that actually for each observation, we take a lot of data. I won't go through all of it, but the main things that we take are what their behavior is and what posture or locomotion they're doing in that behavior, what tree they're in, what their position is in the tree, 
And then if they're doing anything interesting like feeding or walking on the ground or social behavior, then we record that too. So we have 193,000 data points and each of those data points equals one row in this data sheet. And of course, with this amount of data, there's a lot of things that we can look into. So now we're at 10 years. There's a lot of things that we can do with this data on Loris's. Um, so we've been following some of the individuals that we follow now since 2012. So we've been following them continuously for 10 years. Um, we have followed individuals from their birth until their death. We're now following fourth generations of some Loris families. Um, I have in the pictures here on the screen, on the top left is Charlie, one of the first Lorises collared by the project. She's a female. Um, to her right is Luchu, her daughter, who we still follow. Um, on the bottom left is Lupak, who is Luchu's daughter and Charlie's granddaughter. And then bottom right, we have Small, and Small is Lupak's daughter, Luchu's granddaughter, and Charlie's great granddaughter. So we are following matriarchal lines, uh, you know, all the way, all the way from the very beginning of the project, and they're still with us here today, which is absolutely incredible. Um, and with this data, what we can do now is we can start analyzing life histories, and life histories is obviously crucial to their conservation. It also helps us to understand a lot of the previous findings that we've had in the past. And now we can start to piece together um, all of the different parts of the puzzle that we that the team, LFP team, have been kind of collecting over the last 10 years. So now is when the really exciting um, kind of not finishing the puzzle, but answering some of the bigger questions that we have about slow lorises and their evolution. Um, and their history. So it's very exciting stuff. But we don't just follow slow lorises, we don't just collect data on slow lorises. We also do, as Ahmad and Kim have told you already, a lot of wildlife trade work. Um, so we've done in, in Indonesia, we've conducted surveys in 24 locations across the Indonesian islands. Across 10 years, we have observed more than 500 species of bird in markets and over 100 species of mammals and reptiles. Our market survey work is ongoing, um, mostly online with Kim and also occasionally in the field, although it's been a bit difficult with the pandemic. Um, we see a huge range of species still. The slow loris that you can see on the screen here was actually sent to me. The photo was sent to me in 2020 as the seller of this loris was walking the streets of Garu, which is our local town, and offering the loris to people. And the person that he actually offered this loris to was in the Indonesian army. So a contact that I have in the military. Um, so it just shows how how willing people are to disregard the laws and regulations around lorises they are protected and yet there was a seller trying to sell to a member of the indonesian army the military we also do a lot of camera trapping our camera trapping program has been running since 2012. Um, we have camera traps in a range of locations we have them on our wildlife bridges we place them in agricultural ground on terrestrial level also in the canopy in the farms. We've placed them in the forest and we also place them in the coffee plantations. So camera trapping is a really important method of data collection. It gives you the opportunity to collect data on species that would be very difficult to observe. Um, a great example of that for us is civets. And I'll get onto that a bit more in a minute. Um, but especially other species that uh, don't necessarily tolerate human presence, like, like boars, like wild pigs, um, martins, mongooses, et cetera, that you would never be able to approach easily um, in person. We are able to collect data on those species. In terms of our wildlife bridges, we're also able to monitor the effectiveness of the bridges. And um, I included this photo of a loris just because he's pooing and I thought it was funny, um, but we actually would not, we don't often see 
behavior like defecating from lorises because they tend to do it in the canopy and it's not always visible to us when we're collecting um, behavioral observation data. Just to give you an idea of how much data we have on camera traps, and I really can't stress enough how much data we have, uh, we have more than 9,000 photos and videos just of lorises um, from our camera traps since 2012. We've collected uh, photo and video data on 16 species of mammals as well um, between 2012 and 2021, and an unknown number of bird species as well. Birds are notoriously difficult to ID on um, cameras due to the how quickly they move. But uh, camera trap is a really camera trapping is a really important method of data collection for us, and um, with civets especially until we. Uh, finally collared a uh, civet this year, radio collared a civet this year, using camera traps was and occasional sightings was the only way that we were able to collect data on civet um, movements and distribution and population changes. So it's a very important method of data collection for us in the field. Then we collect other, lots of other things as well. We do nocturnal wildlife occupancy surveys, we collect data on the effectiveness of our education curriculums and our outreach activities and initiatives. We collect um, data on coffee plantations as part of our wildlife friendly coffee program. And we also do habitat surveying as well. And I could talk about each of them for quite a long time, but I won't today. So as you can imagine, uh, that kind of quantity of data, we do have some obstacles in our data collection. and. Um, difficulties in data collection can start right from the beginning in the field all the way up to analysing the data when you're writing a paper for publication. Um, obviously, the, the obstacles in the field could be like human error, could be technology error, um, which are very difficult to uh, kind of fix later on. And actually, I have this photo that you can see in front of you as a great example. So the black square on the island of Java, just underneath Bandung, is our field site. And I'm quite zoomed out, but you can imagine there's thousands and thousands of GPS points on, in that red square. If you look up to the north of the island of Sumatra, you will notice a red circle. And that icon, anyone who's worked for LFP will actually recognize that icon. That is the GPS icon of Fernando, one of our long-term male lorises in Chipaganti. Um, so it does appear that one night he took a brief holiday um, to Sumatra. And obviously that is a problem with GPS data collection um, that has made it onto the database. And when I am checking all of the GPS data, I find things like this quite often. Sometimes they're in the Indian Ocean, sometimes they're in Bandung or they've you know had a trip up to Jakarta and things like that. So it's very common to find little mistakes like that that are problems that occurred in the field. Um, and then you also have uh, problems in losing data. This could be losing data to technology. This could be losing data um, through people's actions. They might be unintentional deleting of data. It might be intentional deleting of data. It's something as a project manager you have to consider um, is where is your data backed up? Who has access to your data? Um, and, and how much access are you giving people to all of your data? And it can also, um, you can also have problems of inconsistency in data collection and especially in behavioral observations, that's a really important thing to consider. We have a very detailed ethogram. Um, and if people, people perceive things in different ways and that can result in inconsistencies, which ultimately when we come to analyzing data can throw up problems for us um, for publication. So I certainly don't consider myself to be an expert, but I have spent a lot of the last two years trying to clean the 10 year data set that we have. Um, and so I just would like to share some of the things that I think I consider to be really important um, to prevent some of the problems that I've had to deal with in the last two years. Um, so, as I said, going all the way to the beginning, which is collecting the data in the field. Now, we're very lucky now to have a 
a fairly large team that collect data in the field. That includes local staff, um, staff from all over Java come and work for us. We have students from all over Indonesia. Usually we'd have foreign students, but we haven't had in the last couple of years due to COVID. Um, but we have a fairly big team of around 10 people collecting data for us. So the first thing um, is in the training. And you need to, you should make sure that everybody has access to training materials. So we obviously have our really detailed ethogram. We also have video ethograms, which are available to see on YouTube, um, that the volunteers watch when they arrive at the field station. We also very recently shared for the first time our loris vocalization ethogram so that people can recognize the calls of the lorises that they hear when they're in the field. Um, I also have a loris ID book for the super um, keen students that want to recognize the lorises by their facial markings, which is possible. Um, and they also have access to all of the papers that we have published to date so that they are able to really educate themselves um, and understand how to collect the data and why they're collecting the data. Um, so also really, really consistent and regular training. All of our news volunteers and staff are trained um, both by myself and also by my team of research assistants who are extremely, um, extremely well trained in data collection. And it's not just when you arrive that you need to be trained, that, that training needs to be kept up. You need to be, as a manager or a coordinator, you need to be you know, actively making sure that they're, they're remembering their training, you know, going back in the field with them after a few months to make sure, or a few weeks to make sure that they are still understanding the ethogram, that they are still understanding the data sheet and how to enter the data. Um, I like to give the volunteers a lot of training in how to use technology as well. So that's, we have a thermal camera, we have um, an echo meter for vocalizations, we have the camcorders to record videos and photos, um, just even using a GPS, using a compass, all kind of field skills that you would need um, to collect data. I also teach them how to accurately estimate tree height and accurately es estimate distance and things like that um, to, to kind of ensure that they, one, are learning something, which is really important if they're a student and they've come here to learn, um, but also that there is a consistency in the data that's being collected. And then personally, while I'm managing the data, for me, I found that the most important things when managing a data set this side are to have a consistent coding and filing system. So this, the systems that are LFP aren't systems that I created, they were already there. But when you look at 2012, and then you look all the way at 2021, you can see the transition to where, as a team, we were able to agree on a consistent system for how we were going to manage our data and it really does remove a lot um, a lot of the obstacles in in managing data um, so yeah i i think it's really important to be consistent when you're managing data it can be really hard to um to if you leave, the longer you leave it, the harder it gets basically to manage things. So I always recommend the team, you know, enter their data as soon as they're back from the field so that the data is fresh in their minds. I actively try and manage the data and clean the data and check the data um, right before, uh, right after they come back and they enter it and they give it to me. Um, and it, especially, I just want to say thank you to the team um, for everything that they do because especially last year, our, our most successful year of data collection, that ultimately was down to them, not down to me. Um, and we couldn't have done it without them. And it's really incredible. And as a result of all of their hard work, we now have this data set that we are going to be able to analyze really important things like life history, population changes over time, and, and habitat changes over time. 
So yeah, I just want to say thank you. And um, that's it from me today. So thank you very much for listening. I hope that data, me talking about data wasn't too boring for you, um, because it can be. <laughs> um, but yeah, thank you very much. And follow us on all of our social media to hear more. Thank you so much, uh, Katie, for your talk. And I'm I'm hoping that some people have questions. But again, we have these three talks in a row in principle, and then we will um, have some questions. But I do hope also that uh, that has inspired some people who were watching who are a little bit afraid of managing a long-term data set as well. One of the people who used that long-term data set is Stephanie Poindexter. So she was one of the PhD students who was in Indonesia, but she also worked in Vietnam and she also just worked with the long-term data set as part of her PhD. She's now a assistant professor at State University of New York in Buffalo. And Stephanie, are you ready to share your screen? I am, let's see. Um... All right, one second. There we go. Give permission. Technology Sorry, I'm using a laptop I don't normally use, so I just have to give it permission to to share my screen. Yeah, it's um technology has not been our friends today. Despite using it all, all through the pandemic, suddenly it's like, oh, I know, <laughs> I know the exact feeling. Okay, so I'm gonna leave the meeting for just a second and jump right back on, so it works. I would just like to say, in the meantime, there's some really lovely comments in the chat. Thanking um, Johanna for her amazing work on the slow loris venom. Um, and from that's from Leah, from Thais, thanking people for their incredible work. Um, also from Leah, oh, there is a question for Katie. Maybe we can throw that in while Stephanie's coming back. May I ask how you manage the challenge of storing photos and video data? Is it via hard drives, the cloud, or do you use another method? So it could be good to address that question. Katie, well, um, yeah, I'm back. Sorry. Hi. Um, yeah, that's a great question. So hi, Leah. Um, so we have a very complicated system, which I think everybody can attest to. Um, we are very, very careful. So in the field station, I don't have Wi-Fi, um, but what I do have is a project PC. I also have a personal laptop and then we have three hard drives and they are the they are the master hard drives. So we have one for media, we have one for data and we have one for camera trapping alone because camera trapping is such um, a lot of storage. Um, so when I'm managing data in the field station, I do everything on my PC and immediately everything is moved and copied to the hard drives. So as soon as I finish doing something, I have two copies on the spot of what I need um, saved. I generally can't upload things to the internet from where I am. Um, maybe sometimes Excel spreadsheets, but that's about it. But what I do is I take advantage of work trips into town um, and find a hotel that has good strong wi-fi connection and then i will upload as much as i can over that weekend um, i keep very detailed uh, like tables lists of what has been uploaded onto the like google drive we use google drive um, of what has been uploaded and what hasn't been uploaded that i can share with anna so she knows where to find things Everything is filed very, very carefully. Um, and then when I come to the UK, as I have done now, I also um, bring a hard drive to Oxford, which I can give to Prof Anna, and she then has another backup of it. So we are, you know, as, 
as careful as we possibly can be. Um, but yeah, I rely on I, I rely on offline storage um, cool. in the field station. Yeah. Okie dokie. Thanks for that question, Leah, and helping us to fill the gap while Stephanie mm -hmm. is now ready to do her presentation. Yes, thank you. Thank you. Um, can everyone hear me okay? Yep. I can hear you and see you. Perfect, perfect. That's not always the case. Um, so first I just wanted to say thank you. Thank you, Leah. Um, it's really exciting to be invited to, to be a part of celebrating um, all of the great things that LFP has done over the last 10 years. Um, and as I think about my own sort of career and research efforts and, and interests, um, LFP is like at the center of that because I honestly wouldn't, I probably wouldn't be studying Loris's now if it had not been for, um, for Anna and for the time I spent at LFP. So today I was just gonna talk with you relatively briefly um, about some of the lessons I learned from LFP and how I sort of think about them and, and take them into other projects as I've seen Loris's in, in different places outside of Java. Right, um, so again, it's a pretty short talk. And so I would start just by going over a bit of who I am and my you know, experience with LFP then I'll go through some lessons that I've learned about Loris's, about, you know, field work. Um, and then uh, I just have a slide about looking to the future. So I first visited um, LFP in 2014. I actually had to sit and really think about when, when that actually was. Um, and I remember I had gone to the IPS meeting in Vietnam um, because I did my master's in Thailand. And so I was like, when am I ever going to be this close to, to Hanoi, this is really exciting. Um, and at that meeting is where um, I got talking with Anna and um, Tilo Nadler from the Endangered Primary Rescue Center in which we decided that I would help out with some of their post-release monitor monitoring. Um, and so that was really exciting to have a direction for my project and a place to go. And I think as we walked away, Anna was just like, all right, you need to go to LFP and learn how to do all of the things you'll need to do in Vietnam. Um, and so it was really that idea of gaining skills and learning lessons in this place that all of these other researchers, a lot that we've heard from, um, has sort of gone through the hardships and figured out ways to, to study lorises in the wild. Um, and so I went out in 2014, um, learned all sorts of things, um, but in 2017, after visiting Vietnam, looking at the long-term data set, visiting LFP again, um, I graduated and moved back to the States. Um, so first I spent a little time at Boston University as a postdoc in a, a dry computational lab. Um, and then I started in 2020, in January of 2020, the best of times to start anything new, um, a job as an assistant professor at the University at Buffalo. Um, but it's really great because I carry all of these things that I've learned from LFP. And over that time, um, since knowing Anna, I've had a chance to study the pygmy slow loris in Vietnam, uh, the Bengal slow loris in Thailand, and then of course the Javan slow loris in Java. So we've been a few different places in Southeast Asia. Um, and I'll say that no two sites are the same, not that I thought anyone would expect it to be, but it, it, I definitely feel that. So over that time, I think that my research interests are really rooted in spatial dynamics and movement. Um, and not to say that I'm only interested in GPS points and, and home ranges, but there are so many different elements that go into constructing the social organizations, constructing who's going to be associated with whom, how far you're going to be from a, um, your neighbor or you know, how large or small is your home range going to be? And so I like to think about the physical aspects. And so that's locomotor behaviors, physical ontogeny, um, social behaviors, natal dispersal, as well as some ancestral reconstructions, kind of that computational perspective seeping into, um, you know, actual data from the field, as well as um, how they navigate their environments, really just how they perceive their environments um, from a cognitive perspective. Um, and then since my postdoc, I've really gotten interested in sensory morphology um, and, you know, all of the things you can learn about your environment from the olfactory cues that it emits from the olfactory cues you're emitting to, to signal individuals. Um, and then of course, how does all of that fit and inform conservation? Because that really is um, 
the most important route when it comes to studying soul lorises. We have to make sure that they persist and, and that these populations are conserved for the future. There we go. So some of the things that I've learned about loris is, um, you know, thanks to my time at LFP is that kind of following up on what Johanna said about um, saps and gums being really important in their diet and how important it is, especially in the dry season, is that slow lorises are really well equipped to access gum. Um, they have all of these great morph morphological characteristics that facilitate their access to large trunks to allow them to hold on to these branches for extended periods of time. Um, and to me, that that sort of just signifies how important this resource is for them. Um, and so that's something that I found really interesting and picked up from looking at the data. I also found that slow lorises are, are pretty efficient when they move um, throughout their home ranges. And, and compared to random, random models or random roots, they can hit targets or gum producing trees um, at a more efficient rate, depending on the detection radius. And so, I mean, we can, there's all sorts of details to get into about that, but they seem to have these landmarks that they use to sort of orientate themselves and move with, you know, intention throughout their home range, which is really impressive. And, and thinking back to what John was saying and that, you know, first we had to figure out they were social. And now I think over the 10 years, there's just been so much that you've learned um, about slow lorises and, you know, it keeps surprising people. People who don't study slow lorises are always surprised to hear this thing or hear that. And it's like, you know, thanks to LFP. I also learned that reintroductions are very, very difficult. Um, they're very expensive. The lorises don't stay where you want them to stay. Um, they don't do what you want them to do. And we don't really know why. Um, of course, there's been some success um, in different sites, especially in places that really do a good job of documenting what's happening, such as LFP. Um, but to me, this speaks to, to the fact that slow lorises have a much more complicated relationship with the environment. Um, complicated isn't necessarily bad. Uh, it's just they are probably gaining a lot of information from the resources around them. And it's things that we just haven't been able to measure quite just yet, but it'll be exciting to do so. Um, thinking about the lessons I've learned from LFP, um, I first have the slide about technique, technology, and time. Um, the first place that I saw wild slow lorises was in Java. And so, you know, playing off of what Katie said, I was trained by the, the staff at the time, the research coordinator at the time. And so I really got a great understanding of the ethogram that John worked on. Um, and I realized how much patience and how much time it takes to really sit fine lorises and, and to watch what they're doing over you know, these six 12 hour nights that you're, that you're observing them. I also learned about radio telemetry. Um, and so this is might be one of my first nights out with um, one of the trackers to, to figure out how to use the technology to locate these individuals, um, which is obviously one of the most important parts um, as we go off to collect data. Um, and another thing that really strikes me about LFP is the process in which um, they place collars. Um, having been to different sites, I've seen different approaches to this, and I really like the LFP way of doing it where you are interacting with the individual as little as possible. You don't want them to be uh, kept away for extended periods of time. You know, you kind of make the process as stress-free as possible. Everyone has to be careful. We're putting the collar on, taking our measures, and then we put the loris back where we found them. Um, I think some places just don't realize that you can do it without um, any sort of drugs or any sort of um, overnight observations uh, that with enough skill and practice um, and determination, as cheesy as that sounds, um, it really is possible to do all of this um, without influencing the lores too much. And I'd probably think one of the most important things I learned while at LFP was about troubleshooting. Um, you know, what do you do when these headlamps don't work? Um, what can you fix here? This cable's not working. It's the only cable we have. And so it really gave me sort of a crash course in all the things that um, you would gain over spending loads of time out there and just from experience. And so that was really, you know, essential for me going out 
into the field in Vietnam because it was just me um, and the tracker. And, you know, as silly as it sounds now, um, I was perceived as like the expert. And so I didn't tell anyone that I'd gained all these skills a few months before from LFP, but I was, you know, putting everything that I learned to good use. Um, but we'll go through some of that in the next few slides because it all doesn't all go very well. It doesn't go terribly, but LFP is a very unique and, and great site. Um, so the first thing that comes to mind is visibility. So being trained in an agroforest is fantastic um, because you can actually see the lorises. It's possible to find them and to get a good visual of them, whether you know, you're using binoculars or whatnot, um, you can see what they're doing. This is a photo of me and one of the research assistants in Vietnam. And for the first two weeks I was there, we could hear the, the signal, but we never saw the loris. It took us two weeks to make eyes, to set eyes on this loris. And it was probably, it was one of the most exciting things. I was like, oh, it's right there, it's right there, it's right there. Um, but there is so much obstructing your view. The landscape is not conducive to just sort of walking through and finding and looking up and, and, and you know, trying to get a visual of this already somewhat elusive species. Um, there's a lot of climbing that's happening. There's limestone everywhere. Um, and that's really exciting. But when you want to see the lorises and get lots of data on their behavior, it's pretty difficult. And so I think it's great to start at the other end where you can see lorises, and then you sort of figure out what you do when they're just not very visible. We did find them eventually, and then we consistently were able to, to follow these lorises. But our behavioral data from this site is not anything that would compare to what we're able to take while at LFP. So vi visibility is one of these great things that you probably have very little control over. Um, I also learned a lot about conservation contexts. And so I think LFP has done a really great job of communicating with all of, all of the stakeholders that might be invested in um, slow loris conservation. Like slow lorises are doing great things for the environment. And it's the ability to pull on all of the benefits and figuring out what is needed by the community and tying all of that together to help, you know, create this synergistic feeling with slow lorises in, in the populations. And so whenever I think about slow lorises in other places, I'm never thinking about them as a, in a vacuum. I'm never thinking, oh, I'm just going to go and study the slow lorises and then get out of there. It's really important to think about all of the other animals that are in that community. It's important to think about the people within that community um, and how we can all sort of work together and what we can learn from how they interact with each other to sort of inform their conservation and, and inform the research, to be honest. And so that was another important lesson from LFP. Um, back to the ethogram, comparability. Um, comparability is really, really important. Uh, this data sheet, this is just a little sample of, of the data sheet that I've used, that others have used. Um, while in Thailand at a rescue center, someone came to collect some DNA samples or fecal samples that they were going to extract DNA from. Um, and I was just there to give them a hand. I was working on another project that was just behavioral observations of the lorises they had there. Um, and lo and behold, as I go to help them, they pull out this exact data sheet. And it just sort of made me feel happy. And, and it was nice to know that these resources that LFP has worked hard on to you know, make available um, and to figure out what makes sense based on you know, trial and error are things that are are spreading and, and helping others. And so if you're using the same data sheet, you're using the same ethogram, you're increasing the likelihood that I'll be able to compare the, you know, resting behaviors of the Bengal slow lorises here to the resting behavior of the Javan slow lorises there. Um, and that's really interesting information because how does the environment affect those, those variables um, or the likelihood or the frequency or the percentages of, of all of these different things that they might be doing. Um, and so it's always great when you can compare apples to apples instead of apples to oranges, or as I like to say, apples to organs, when you're really far apart um, on the spectrum of, of what is actually comparable. Right. Um, and then I like to think about studying slow lorises the LFP way. Um, and so, 
we can always prioritize different things, but reflecting back on how successful LFP has been and all of the data, as you heard, they have been able to capture and collect over the last 10 years. Um, it's really inspiring for future research. Um, and I think that these priorities are things that make all of that possible. Um, and so disturbing the loris as little as possible is gonna give you the most naturalistic behaviors. It's going to um, allow you to spend more time watching them. Having them for a short period of time during collars is going to prevent them from you know, trying to avoid you in the future. Um, you always have to record everything. And this is a lesson probably learned from dealing with the, the long-term data set after the fact, is that you want to find this thing, you come up with a question, and you've got all of this data to look through. Um, and you can see little points in which you could have recorded it, but you didn't, or maybe so-and-so could have recorded it, but we didn't. And so it isn't as straight a path as it could have been. Um, and so record everything, write all of the stories, um, write as much detail as you can, and then you have the time to do it. So it's just a matter of um, thinking to the future. You might not need that data now. It might not be a part of your question now, but it, you know, research just produce more, produces more questions. You answer what you've set out to answer, it's gonna result in more things that perhaps if you collected more data or you had a broader data set, not data set, you had a broader, um, ethogram, you could revisit these questions even after the fact. Um, I also think that it's really important to build a community um, and to focus on mutualism and figuring out what it is you can provide for others and, and what others can provide for you and how, how to find a balance between those things. Um, it's never advantageous to work on your own or in a vacuum or to, to just think you're here for one purpose when there, there's so much going on around you. Um, and probably the most exciting thing and the thing I like to stress the most is sharing what you know, sharing your results, sharing your data, sharing research opportunities. I think we're, we're never going to get anywhere if we try to um, hoard things. Um, and I think LFP has done a really great job of, of offering opportunities, of, of collaborating with others, um, and thinking about how sharing what we know with others can um, you know conserve lorises because that's ultimately the goal. Okay, um, right. Looking to the future for research, I think building on all of the great work that LFP has done, um, and as I sort of just set out on this on this career, wanting to study lorises in the wild and, and figuring out how to gain new new data that might help conservation efforts. I'm really excited to think about uh, biologgers and, and what we can learn from aerial views. And I know LFP is, is now doing a lot of work in that as well. So I am forever going to be continuing to learn things um, from LFP and, and you know, following the really great example that they've set. I'm also excited to expand on the in-depth understanding of more slow lowers populations. Um, as many people have said already today, LFP is very unique and it is the longest and only um, long-term field site on slow lorises. And imagine if there were more places like that where we could compare you know, life histories, which yes, takes a really long time to gain that data. And so we need to consider places in, in ways in which we can you know, expand the pool of long-term uh, sites for slow lorises. Um, and, you know, tying in my interest in sensory morphology, I really think that now that there is sort of a better understanding of the mysteries of slow lorises, it's now figuring out what's happening at this probably molecular and, and chemical level between the environment and the slow lorises. We already know that they have benefits for the environment. Um, it's just looking at those mechanisms that I think will be really interesting in the future um, and will also help inform the way that they may shift as the climate shifts or, or how they can shift as anthropogenic forces or you know, pressures become ever present within all forested environments, unless you know, we do something to stop it. Um, but all in all, all of the things that I'm interested in now and the way that I think about lorises today is really rooted in what I've learned from Dr. Nakaris and what I've learned from being at LFP. Um, 
And so while no two forests are the same or no two slow loris populations are the same, I've got a really strong base and like a long history of people who have been able to learn from to help build these projects in other places. And so with that, I'm always very thankful. Um, and I wanna thank all of you for listening to me sort of ramble on about all of the things that I've learned from LFP and, and you know, just exciting Loris things. Um, but yes, my email's here in case anyone has any questions or I'm happy to take any questions. But um, thanks again for giving me the chance to talk about Loris's, which is always fun. Okay, thank you so much. Um, yeah, so I'm just checking. We do have one last speaker and then I was gonna have the final questions after that, but it's always worth just checking if there's any questions in there now. Um, people have been quite quiet on Facebook as well. I would just like to say, I've, I've been looking at some of the Facebook discussions and I don't know what's gone wrong with Eventbrite and the link because the the link to this, um, this Zoom was on Eventbrite, so and it and some people made it here. So I'm not really sure what's happened with all of the technology today, and uh, I apologize for that. But thank you for your wonderful talk, Stephanie. And I feel really inspired that you're going to be able to go on and do amazing things with Loris's in other countries. Because incredibly, like it, it is incredible that now we know there are nine species of slow Loris. There's even another new subspecies, which might be elevated to species. And yet still there's virtually no field studies of this really unique primate, despite so many other primates, I don't know, like orangutans, which are in the same geographic range, having so many species of so many populations of the same species. So uh, <laughs> hopefully, hopefully more people will be inspired to study lorises and in your role as a, a lecturer, you'll be able to do that for them. Um, there is one quick question. It's amazing to hear about your experiences in the field. I enjoyed your summary on the Loris's future. Oh, it's not a question, just a, a lovely comment. Amazing to see what you'll be able to do in the future. Okay, well, our last speaker today is um, a, a very important one. And this is Nida Alfulaj from People's Trust for Endangered Species, who has been supporting um, slow Loris research and slender Loris research in Sri Lanka even um, for, for about, gosh, it's been almost 20 years now. And about, I think it's three years ago, we were made a conservation partner of People's Trust for Endangered Species, which um, meant that we had three years of guaranteed funding. And when that happened, it was really exciting because I knew it would take us in to this 10 years. So um, Nita is just gonna give a little perspective on funding small field projects like ours and the difference that PTS has been able to make. So Nita, you, I'm inviting you to share your screen. Thank you very much, Anna. So hopefully you can see my screen now. Is that right? I can see you and hear you. Great, fantastic. Well, um, thank you for inviting me to speak and thank you everyone who's spoken before such interesting fascinating talks as Anna said we've been involved with um, Loris work for a long time but I've learned so many new things this morning which is um, brilliant um, and thank you very much to the team for translating my slides so I just going to give you a short talk about the kind of challenges and highlights um, of funding long-term studies. Um, so um, my wildlife charity is called People's Trust for Endangered Species. Um, we were set up in 1977, so we've been going for quite a while now. Um, and for as long as I remember, we've been um, supporting work on different loris species, um, slow loris and slender loris, as Anna said. Um, we've funded quite a lot of Anna's work, but also um, Nabajit Das's work as well on the Bengal slow loris. And um, the work that we've supported has been hugely varied um, and um, has covered a lot of what's been discussed already this morning, um, this afternoon in Indonesia, um, um, relating to agro um, um, forestry and coffee production and wildlife friendly bridges and engaging the wider community but in particular children um, in learning about these fascinating creatures. 
Um, so why has People's Trust for Endangered Species supported loris conservation um, over the years? Well, um, for many for many reasons, um, they're critic. You know, the Javan slow loris is critically endangered. We do look at IUCN red list status of species um, in terms of whether we can give funding to them or not. Um, very importantly, though, lorises are incredibly engaging and photogenic, which um, is important for reasons that I will speak about shortly. Um, the work that um, Anna in particular has done through the Little Fireface project um, with many of you is a, a really important balance of both scientific research, but also very practical conservation, which is important um, for us. That's the type of work um, we want to support. And um, as mentioned previously, the, the work engages a much broader community um, and um, team of stakeholders, and, and that's important for the longevity of the work and for the conservation of, of the species. So um, Anna asked if I could talk about some of the challenges for um, funders um, and fundraising trusts or organizations are very different they all have very different backgrounds in terms of where their funding comes from and then what their constitutions or their remits are um, so i'm just going to talk to you about pts um, in particular and we're rel i i sit on a small group of other similar funders um, whitley fund for nature rufford the mohammed bin zayed um, um, conservation fund you know we kind of talk behind the scenes and uh, you know always trying to think about ways that we can help um, the practitioners you guys on the ground you know access funds more easily and make life easier for you um, but we all have very different backgrounds and so we're relatively unusual in that group because all, nearly all of our funds come from individuals from our supporters um, we write to them several times a year, literally write mostly printed letters um, that we post, but we are trying to build up our um, e-appeals as well because it's more environmentally friendly and we can reach um, a large audience. But we literally send um, a handful of appeals to our supporters each year to about 4,000 people and then and they, and they donate money to us and our average donations about 25 pounds at the moment. Um, but we have very, loyal supporters who will donate to every appeal that we send out or we have some who particularly like different kinds of species or different areas of the world to support um, and because this is the way that we generate our income that we then give to conservation projects we need to engage our supporters so that goes back to what i said before about loris as being very photogenic um, and appealing um, but of course that doesn't mean that those are the only types of species we support work on we we also like to support work on the little known species that johanna mentioned um, earlier but we have to be mindful that maybe not all of our supporters um, will be donating to appeals if we write about um, stag beetles, for instance, or or, um, or maybe some lesser known fish species in Uganda, which we're supporting at the moment. So um, we tell the stories quite often with um, species like lorises because um, because people can will relate to them easily. Um, and then briefly, we do get some other funding from some of our supporters leave us legacies which is great because that's unrestricted funding and then we do get some grants um, from trust funds ourselves and government which we put to um, restricted fund projects um so i mentioned you know what species to support we work with um organizations obviously like little five-face project which works on lorises we work on we work with bat conservation trusts. We work with um, lots of NGOs that are, um, have a have a focus on a single species or single group of species. And of course, that's not what we are. That's not how we grew. So even though we've got lots of supporters who love hedgehogs, for instance, or lions, we know that um, our supporters are supporting. PTES because they know that we'll then support projects on a very broad range of species um, around the world as well as in the UK. Um, so it's important to us when we're writing those appeal letters that I spoke to you about that we've got different species to talk about and different challenges um, and then our supporters feel like their their money's supporting lots of 
different um, um, challenges and lots of different species. Um, and the other thing just to bear in mind for us, but that's a similar point for other funders, is that we can receive, you know, well over 100 applications each time we put out a call um, to say we're, you know, we're going to give give new grants. Um, so there's high competition and we just we just we work very hard behind the scenes, raising as much money as we can so we can support as many projects as possible, because we'd ideally like to support all of them. Um, and another challenge is who to support. So um, not a challenge, but it's something to bear in mind. So Anna, you're a great example. Um, you mentioned our conservation partnerships. Um, so we, we this is a few years ago, we thought, you know, people like Anna are coming to us every couple of years to say, you know, please can I apply again for more funding you know and that's a big burden on you and what we'd like to do is establish a few long-term partnerships whereby we support people for five years um with with a greater amount of funding to give you security um and when we were looking for who to support you know they, these these people like anna you know they've got great leadership skills, great communication and engagement skills. And the, the, the other projects that we're supporting, like Little Fireface projects, they're, they're so much more than just, not just because it's very important, but just the research looking into the ecology of species. But they're, they've got, you know, real buy-in from the local community. Um, they're, you know, they're involving school children uh, university students and there's um there's a much broader reach into the community so um those are those are the people that we know and uh, that i know other funders are really looking to support um and then of course we know that you have your challenges um we know that because we also fundraise to support our own conservation projects on on british mammals predominantly but other things as well so we know how hard it is um, and how important it is to fundraise to cover core costs of of staff and computer equipment etc and we we know how difficult it is as well to fundraise for the same things every year because you know in in conservation you have to do the same things day in and day out and year um, after year collecting the data um, and um, and analyzing the data um, etc so we know that these things are important um, as well and we know that um, there are things that you need to do such as attend conferences or cover journal fees that don't seem quite such sexy propositions to funders but we know that these are important and that the fundraising takes up your time and um, the reporting takes up time as well so we're aware of all these challenges for you and, and we are kind of talking with other funders about ways of making things easier um so now i've talked about the challenges and they're not kind of you know not to be negative but now you know there are there are huge positives of um and highlights of funding long-term projects um I, I feel like we've always supported loris work and it's um it's been great because we're we can um we can see the impact that's been made and that's so important um and that's you know especially now in terms of you know the biodiversity crisis we know we all know it's been happening for such a long time but hopefully the wider world has you know woken up to it we know that um long-term funding long-term studies are so important for us to be able to address the critical um conservation challenges we're facing um and and that these long-term studies can enable growth and development you know you've all mentioned how um little fireface project started off um with just a handful of people and look now how it's grown and i can't wait to see what it looks like in another 10 years um and and as i mentioned these most of our conservation partners it's not just about setting up the research departments and the um research teams but it's developing a, an ngo normally and that gets greater buy-in for the community and um you know that will really help um, in the long term, make all this work sustainable, um, which is which is very important. And from our point of view, for our supporters, you know, they they love hearing about um, lorises and all the things that you've learned continuously, the new new findings and the, and the stories. Um, you know, they have a real buy into that. So I just finish on some of the highlights that we've been able to share um, with with our supporters. You know the helping them commit will you help pledge to end slow loris suffering and signing signing um petitions to raise awareness 
but also um, being able to tell them interesting facts um, about these venomous primates with the longest, longest tongues um, and engage them in, in things such as the name the baby loris competition. So we we really appreciate that. We know that our supporters are invested in, in lorises and loris conservation. And I think that we're just building a, a bigger community, you know. Um, so congratulations, Anna, and congratulations to all your team um, for, for what you've done, starting, you know, here in Java. But as Stephanie said, the reach um, is expanding, um, which is fantastic to see. So thank you all for listening. And I will stop sharing my screen now. Thank you so much. Thank you. And, and again, thank you for your wonderful support. It's it's such an honor to actually be a conservation partner. And it's the kind of thing you never think is going to happen to you or to happen to a slow loris. <laughs> you always think it's going to happen to chimps and elephants and tigers. And it's so wonderful, the 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 handful of funders who's continued to help us even through the pandemic as well. Um, and we've been able to keep going. So this brings us to our last speaker. Um, and I'm hoping that some of you there have some questions or do you want to discuss anything or bring up any final points or um, ask any of us anything? Because I had hoped we could have had a bit more roundtable discussion in the in the breaks, but because of our, our strange and unexpected technical difficulties, that's been more difficult than I thought it would be. Um, I'm just keeping an eye on the chat and I'm also looking again can, if there's anything on can Facebook. I, can I jump in with a question? Oh, please do. It was about Ibu with uh, Teti. Hopefully I've pronounced your name right. It was about the captive breeding you mentioned. Um, and I just wanted to ask a bit more about that because we're involved in captive breeding of British mammal species. So it's always interesting to see that, you know, um, the different setups. And so firstly, I was wondering, I think you said they're all confiscated animals that you've just decided to keep. Um, but are you keeping them in family groups? Do you think maybe the low survival rate of the infants is something to do with not having siblings or the father there? Or are they kept in family groups and then the, you know, the high mortality is due to something else? I can see Ibu Tati. <laughs> seems to be here but she may let's see i've asked her to unmute so she can know she's being asked a question i can answer a little bit of that question however um yeah. in general in captivity because laura's home ranges are so large in the wilds um and they are territorial sometimes when you try to put a captive pair together it doesn't work very well so so then people say, oh, they're, they're not unimale, unifemale. They don't like each other. They try to kill each other. So pairing can take some time, just like it does for gibbons, which is another famous unimale, unifemale primates. Um, also, this potential lack of gum in captivity, it, it affects their re reproduction. It affects their developments. Um, also, it affects their whole digestion. If they don't get enough gum, it affects how they digest other things. And we know with the infants, they're eating gum from two months old. So um, they already eat quite a lot of gum. And, and a, it's very difficult to get gum in Indonesia. So it'd be interesting to know how much gum Teti's feeding them. But in a rescue center in Vietnam, once they change the diet to almost 100% gum, their survival rates dramatically increased. That's so fantastic, isn't it? Yeah, that's also important. And also how close the cages are kept to each other. So if you have a lot of animals in cages that are territorial, but they're next to each other, it causes extreme stress, over grooming and, and other problems like over licking, which they can over lick themselves with their own venom. And this also can cause the babies to die as well. Wow. And, and so, again, that rescue center in Vietnam, uh, they found that they had to separate the cages by a long distance. And, it, and to let the lorises have their own territories in the cages, and that helps their survivability. So these are all things that are challenges when you don't have enough space, you yeah. don't have enough money for cages, and you can't find gum to feed. And do they, when they're fed the gum, is are they, are they literally just given it, or are they, um, are they kind of replica trees so they have to access it themselves and go through the natural behaviour? 
Um, that's the best way to do it. And again, that's what they're doing in Vietnam. This is Dao Tian Rescue Center that's run by Monkey World. Okay. And, uh, and, and we do that as well, as much as we can when we're working with confiscated lorises. We give them gouging devices so they have to extract the gum themselves because we found if they're not able to extract gum themselves, they get atrophied jaws when they go back to the wild. And we even had a loris, they have um, an unfused mandibular symphysis, which means their lower jaw bone is made up of two bones. And because she had jaw atrophy from captivity, it actually caused her jaw to split in two because of the pressure from the, because she didn't have the musculature to gouge and she died actually. Oh, that's really sad. So yeah, I mean, as, as much as possible, they need to be replicating their natural behavior. Yeah. That's understandable. Okay, so we have some some nice comments again from Kim. A big thanks to all the speakers. Wonderful, wonderful to hear from everyone in such a nice round of all the amazing work. So it does highlight what a collaborative and supportive group the team is. Anna Faraj would like to know about the outcome of confiscated lorries that enter rescue facilities. How many can successfully be released, and what are the biggest challenges that rescue centers? face and caring, caring for confiscated lorises. I think this is something Stephanie could, could talk about. I could talk about it as well, but um, it would be great if Stephanie wants to address that question. Are you still here, Stephanie? I am, yes, I'm still here. Um, hmm. I think that, so that's an interesting question because I think there's a balance between, so you wanna, you confiscate these individuals um, it's very expensive to care for them in captivity. It's also really expensive to reintroduce them. Um, and so there's always sort of this idea as well that them being out in the wild might be nicer. And so I've had experience where I felt like it was a bit rushed and it might not have, I mean, they, they you know, there's not a whole lot of success in, in reintroductions. Um, especially when when they aren't really strategically planned. But I think that there is always sort of this battle or trade-off between how many you can actually carry in the rescue center and how many can successfully um, be reintroduced. Um, but I think the way that we also talk about success and reintroductions is a little murky because, you know, how long do they need to survive? Do they need to make another generation? Is it just surviving through the months that we're able to follow them? Um, and so it's hard to say. I did not give you a direct answer, but I think it's murky. I don't know, Anna, what do you? Well, I, I do think actually, I mean, some people describe the wildlife trade as a cut flower industry. And once you take the animal out of the wild, its chances to go back, no matter what the species is, is really small. And we know that in very good, um, very well-funded reintroduction translocation projects in countries like Australia or New Zealand, where the government very well funds those projects, you still expect a, an 80% death rate. So right. it's, it's just hard to get animals back to the wild. And it is harder when your translocations are for welfare or for the humans to feel good about letting the animal out of the cage, rather than reinforcing populations that are either extremely small in the wild or that are um, you know, ne needing reinforcement. What we often mm -hmm. see instead is 20 slow lorises released into a national park with a very good population of slow lorises that are very territorial and they are going to kill each other and somebody's going to win. Um, or 20 slow lorises released into a national park without any radio collars or 20 slow lorises released in one place without teeth. And so this, this comes from you know, the sometimes conflict that's been defined between conservationists and animal welfare people. Um, but luckily there are some good groups really trying to make found foundations for translocations. And one of the things we did is we compared translocations to the actual dispersal process of wild individuals. And we found there's a, a lot of similarities and the important similarity is the animal doesn't stay where you put it, it moves and it can go six kilometers from where you put it because it's looking for home. And, and so that's gonna be really important in translocations is how the animals are released, how they know their area. And so Stephanie's work also showed that if they have a cognitive map of the area through a better soft release process where they know where their feeding trees are, they're more likely to potentially stay. So these are all gonna be important things 
for the future. There's a few other questions coming. I see one about, does LFP also work with data from captive loris populations from other continents or zoos or scientific institutions? So we do advise rescue centers. Um, I'm actually on the Persimian Taxon Advisory Group for EASA, and I do some work with the Persimian Taxon um, Advisory Group for AZA as well. And um, one of the projects we're working on right now in collaboration with Helena Fitch Snyder, who used to be the stud bookkeeper for Lorises, and some data from the Duke Lemur Center, we're actually trying to um, use our wild data and development data and the, the, the very, very good daily development data that could be collected in zoos to um, develop growth trajectories for lorises to understand their really their growth and development. So we couldn't really do this till we had these 10 years of data because it's so difficult to collect that data in the, those data in the wild, but being able to compare with zoos is great. We also have been working with Sheldon Wildlife Trust here in the UK, for example, to develop protocols for accelerometers and to understand the baseline data needed to interpret the wild data. Um, we've been working with many zoos, helping them to change their diet to gum and see what happens to the animals when the diet is changed to a gum diet. And with Francis Cabana, one of um, the former PhD students, we've published a few papers on that. So I think quite, we're trying to work quite a lot with zoos. Um, and then we also have a question about, do we engage with uh, cultural anthropologists or other social scientists in Indonesia? Uh, more and more, we have many different universities we're working with. And, um, and the volunteers we get and their supervisors come from social anthropology, come from marketing, come from a lot, a lot of agricultural sectors. And, um, and the agricultural sectors include the side working with farmers, farming cooperatives, marketing, and actually business. So with our coffee program, we're getting more into business as well. So um, this is this is important also with educators. So we're working with local teachers and, te and um, teachers at the local level, but also teachers who are coming to um, get training in environmental education and that sort of thing. So to a certain extent, yes, and that's happening more and more. And, um, and actually with our, our relationship with Universities Gajamada as well, we're trying to open up that relationship that students from other faculties than forestry, for example, might want to come do what, what Dr. Imran mentioned earlier of doing this sort of volunteer tourism. One way to say what volunteer tourism is, is, is that you are volunteering, but you can be from all these different sectors and um, work on different aspects of the projects. There's another question, is the gum fed to Loris is endowed TM uh, available for captive Loris is in the UK? It's a very unique type of gum that's kept, tapped from trees that's used in a local drink, the, the type of gum they have at Dao Tien, and it is not available in the UK in that tree species is, is not here, but, um, but the gums that are available in the UK would be just as suitable for lorises. It just so happens that they, they really like that gum there. Um, but we know, we know that once lorises get used to gum, sometimes they're like, oh, I, I don't know what that is. It's a little bit odd. And then they, they really start to like to eat it. And it's made a big difference for a lot of captive um, populations. And Nita asked, do, we, do you just feed it in a dish? It's ideal not to feed it in a dish. And again, what Nick Dunn, um, who's one of the slow loris, um, I guess, uh, stud bookkeepers, or he, he's in charge of their, their tax on advisory group for slow lorises here in the UK or in Europe, especially Bengal slow lorises. He's devised some really nice methods using a dropper and putting the gum in a dropper and putting it on different grooves and they can lick some of it some of it gets hard so they are they can lick and they can gouge which is what they do in the wild and um yeah and and even when we were working with lorises and rescue centers in thailand with um, one of my master's students uh, who has just published her work in applied animal behavior science on um using gum as a supplement that's just commercially available gum that you can buy in Thailand that worked very well for the lorises. So there's lots of gum out there. And, uh, and I think lorises in the wild eat many different kinds of gum, toxic gum, sweet gums, plain gums. So introducing that to their diet could be valuable as well. All right, well, we've done very well. We're only half an hour beyond our time, despite about a half an hour 
problem of technical difficulties in the beginning. We will advertise widely on our social media that this will be available as a full length video that we are going to make available on our YouTube channel and, and link that to Facebook. Um, oh, I see one more question. Uh, in terms of the genetic research, are there specific biomarkers or gene sequences in any database that scientists can use to identify certain species? So there, there is someone here who might be able to answer that question a little bit, which is Leah, the PhD student whose PhD is assembling the slow loris genome. But um, there is one genome now available, I believe, on GenBank. But for all the species, there's still not a lot of work done yet. And we were hoping when Leah does assemble this genome for the Bengal slow loris, we will be able to um, get those markers for other species as well. So because once we have a really good idea of an assembled genome, the idea is that we could start working on the taxonomy of all these other species and help people who rescue them in trade repatriate them to the place where they should be and know what they're dealing with and not just have to deal with photographs of animals that look incredibly similar, which is a big problem for cryptic nocturnal species because they do not use vision to identify each other. Um, and that was from Cecilia in, in Singapore. Oh, there's one more power out. Just a thank you, another nice thank you message. So um, I think I'm going to call this conference to a close. I would like to thank all the speakers and thank the organizers. I'd like to give a special shout out to Luke Quarles, who's a master's student on our master's in primate conservation at Oxford Brooks, who managed to be to resolve the technical difficulty. And from his computer, he's been um, casting us live to Facebook. So thank you to Luke and to Smitha, who was frantically uh, looking at ways to get us live. And thanks to the audience for your patience. Thanks to all the speakers and everyone who's been a part of Little Fireface Project. I never dreamed this would, well, I dreamed this would get to 10 years. I didn't think it would happen and it has. And, um, and it's all down to this amazing collaborative group of people who really love slow lorises and have a passion to see them stay where they should be, which is in the wild. So with that, I'm going to stop the recording and uh, I hope you all enjoy watching this conference if you want to watch it again in the future.